Hello, everybody. Welcome to this event by Pragmatic Works. This is going to be our class on data modeling. So welcome to another event. In this event, we're going to be taking a look specifically at data modeling for Power BI. But it's important to point out that the data modeling that we're talking about here has been around for many, many years. And really, it is agnostic to the technology, meaning that when you're building out a data model for reporting purposes, it does work across different technologies. I was actually spending my week this week, three days with a company where we were building out a data model for them, for their enterprise, teaching them about this concept and then how to load those tables using SSIS. So completely different technology, but that's what we were doing this week. So hopefully everybody can hear me. I'm watching the chat just to make sure. I see people from literally all over the world joining us today. So welcome everybody. Um, it's exciting to have you guys here. So let's jump right in and just do a real quick introduction to myself. I am a consultant and trainer here at Pragmatic Works. I've been with Pragmatic Works for 10 years. Um, I spent the beginning of that actually doing consulting, specifically building out data warehouses, building out dimensional models for customers and helping them load that data for reporting purposes into their systems. The last four or five years, I've been doing specifically training, helping companies learn how to do these things, how to implement their data model, how to work with Power BI and Azure. And if you've followed us for any length of time, you know that. I've had an opportunity to author a few different books over the years. I blog at MitchellPearson.com. Not as much as I do YouTube, of course. YouTube is a little bit easier for us since we record all the time. And then I have a wife and three kids here in Florida. So Florida, United States, that's where most of our consultants and trainers are located at. And I also enjoy playing tabletop games. Now, you already know we have a YouTube channel, Pragmatic Works. Make sure to take a moment to subscribe to that channel so you don't miss any events like this in the future. And there we go. If you want to reach out to me, you can reach out to me, ilmpearson at pragmaticworks.com. So we have a lot of content today that we're going to get into. So I say it's time to let's jump right in and take a look at some of the logistics and the agenda. If you've been to any of these big events that we do every three months, we generally have some kind of sell, either for boot camps or on-demand learning. We have classes and boot camps that are structured, of course, around data modeling because data modeling is very important. And so my coworker, Matt, is monitoring the chat today. He's going to drop right there in the chat window a link directly to where you can get our on-demand learning for a year for 50% off, where we have classes on data modeling. I actually did a class a couple of years ago just on the dimensional model, regardless of the technology. And then we also have our DAX boot camp that we do about once a month. Uh, I think the one coming up is actually full, though. So you might not be able to sign up for the one in August, but in that class, we actually talk about dimensional modeling and stuff like that at the beginning because it's important to everything that we do in Power BI. So a little bit about the logistics here. If you want the class files, feel free to go down into the description and you'll find the class files there. There's a quick little form and then you can download the files. There's also a course completion certificate. People love that. Take the course completion certificate, fill it out and post it on LinkedIn for us so more people can come and watch this and be more educated about Power BI in general. So definitely go ahead and do that. Um, the timing today is gonna to be from 11 to two. Hopefully we'll get done a little bit before two o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and then we'll take a break somewhere in that 12 o'clock Eastern hour, probably around 12.20, 12.25, something like that, a quick 15 minute break so I can recover from all the talking that I'm going to be doing here. And good morning, bud, nice to see you. All right, so the agenda. The agenda is going to be primarily really focused on at the beginning here laying a foundation for what are facts and dimensions a dimensional model a star schema you've probably heard this mentioned of before but what is it why is it important so that's where we are going to start then we're going to get into how you create the data model in power bi because you can do that in a couple different places this week i was with a customer we were doing that in management studio we were creating tables and relationships and foreign keys right that's a different technology but the terminology that we're talking about today applies, right? So we're going to talk about how to create that data model in Power BI. We're also going to cover what if I have multiple fact tables? How does that impact things? Aggregate tables, calculation groups, and then different storage modes. Jula Free, I saw that. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. All right. So with that being said, before we jump right in, I want to recommend a couple of different books here. First of all, the Data Warehouse Toolkit was the first book that I ever read over 10 years ago, 
Um, that's what the company gave me. And my good buddy, Dustin Ryan, who's over at Microsoft now, kind of walked through that with me and mentored me. The Data Warehouse Toolkit is a phenomenal, awesome book. You also have the Star Schema. The Star Schema, I actually recommend and I like a little bit more. I think it's more um, consumable. I think it's easier to digest. It's a little bit more straightforward. I would recommend, if you want to dive deeper into this, that you get one or both of those books because they're both great. Data modeling in and of itself, let me just be very clear, is something that you literally can spend a career doing and learning. So you're never really, I would say, an expert in data modeling because it's more of an art than it is a science. You have to model your data based on your requirements and what you're trying to accomplish, right? But the good thing is that for Power BI, because Power BI is a lot of times a smaller subset of tables, you don't need to know all of those different things and you know have years of experience to build a pretty solid data model. In fact, we do that for customers in our hackathons all the time, where we'll do a two-day, five-day hackathon where they bring their data. We teach them on their data how to build a model and how to have something consumable at the end. So you can do a lot with the basic star schema that we're going to be covering in this class today. And Peter says that you should go with the Data Warehouse Toolkit. I agree with you, Peter. It's a good book. All right. So let's jump right in and talk a little bit about data modeling. Now, as we're diving into this, one of the things that we should do is we should talk about things that you need to consider as you start to build out your model. You're looking at your data, you start to build out your model. What are the things we need to be thinking about? One, what are you measuring? What are you trying to accomplish, right? Am I trying to, the customer I was working with this, this, this week was looking at invoices for accounts payable that they were purchasing. And so very specifically, they were trying to see what the invoices were and what was paid and what was left to be paid, right? And so they knew very specifically what they were trying to accomplish. So you wanna know what you're measuring because that's going to impact the tables that we're going to be creating in your model. Also, what types of business problems are you trying to solve? Generally, you already know the answers to this because you can go in and look at existing reports and ask the end users, hey, what's not in here or what would you like to have in this report that's not already there, right? And so they will give you that information and say, look, here's the problem we're trying to solve. So then we can build out a model that will help us to solve that problem. How much data are you working with? This becomes extremely important when we're working with Power BI specifically, right? Because unlike maybe Azure SQL database or a database, Power BI is going to put everything ideally in memory so we can get optimal performance. But it also means that generally speaking, there are some exceptions. We're going to be very limited on how much data we can get in. So how much data are you expecting to be working with today? And then how much work or data do you expect to have in the future? And if you know that you're going to have significantly more data in the future, then a solution that you build today might not scale and might not work. So we got to go with a different method. And then, of course, what are your data sources and where's the data coming from? Because that will also impact the data that we're bringing in and where we're getting the data from. All right. So there's many more things to consider than what's on the slide right here. And I'm going to talk about this. Today is going to be very conversational. We're going to get into a practical demo that will take up a lot of our time but it's gonna be very conversational. I'm watching the chat window, and if I see some things that really drive home some points, I'll make sure to mention that and bring those things out. So attributes of a good data model, very important. One, it should be easily understood and consumed. Now, one of the things we do, and I don't almost wanna mention this because we do so much of it already. I'm not necessarily trying to get a bunch of people to sign up for this, but we do virtual mentoring, one-on-one -on -one mentoring with customers to help them out to understand the concepts of Azure, Power Apps, Power BI, things like that better, right? And in those sessions, as they pertain to DAX and Power BI, 90% of the time, the VM calls that I'm on, one-on-one -on -one comes down to the data model. The data model could have been designed in a way that was more optimal. See, that's a very diplomatic answer. The data model could have been designed in a way that was more optimal than what it currently is. And many of you probably have Power BI models. Power BI data models. And if you open them up, you realize that it's going to be very difficult to explain to people the different tables that are in that model. That means it's probably not easily understood and easily consumed. So that's definitely going to be the first point here, attribute of a good data model. Also, we want to make sure that large data changes are scalable. What that means is that as you continue to add more data to your data model, it continues to perform well. And so we can do things like make sure that it continues to perform well by building it the way we're going to talk about today in a way that is going to perform well over time. Also, it should provide predictable performance, meaning that every time you refresh your dashboard, you refresh your reports, you change your slicers, 
those, uh, those things can be um, predictable. You should expect if it takes five seconds to run one time, you run it again, it should still be around that five second time frame. It shouldn't take 57 seconds to run just because you change the slicer on one of your dimensions. And then of course it needs to be flexible and adaptable. This is one of those things that is very, very important. So I see a couple of questions in the chat. Will the slides be available? I will add them to the, the download after the class. So the current class files do not have that. I will add them. And then yes, all of our sessions are always recorded. If you go back to our YouTube channel, you'll find many of these three hour events that are there and ready for you to consume. Now, when I say flexible and adaptable, what I'm talking about is that we build a model that supports what we're trying to do today, but then in the future, we can add additional tables and it still supports that. And this really comes down to, and I'm going to go back to my buddy, Dustin Ryan over at Microsoft. One of the things he told me, I'll never forget, probably the best piece of advice he ever gave me is when you build a data model, it never gets simpler. It never gets easier. It always grows and becomes more complex. So if you build a data model from the very beginning with five or six tables, and you're already building that data model in a way that is complex, then when you start to add tables in the futures and additional columns and additional requirements, it's going to eventually just get out of hand and out of control, right? And so you want to make sure from the very beginning, we keep it as close to what you see on the screen here, this star scheme I'm going to talk about in a minute as you possibly can. Okay. So flexible and adaptable, very important, but not at the expense of being understand, understood and things like that. So another reason that we talk about data models is because there are certain things that are going to be a lot easier if you have a good data model. And that's going to be things like managing storage constraints, right? So if you put everything in one big flat table, it's not going to be good for your storage requirements. It's going to take up more space in your data model. Also, if you want to performance tune your data model, having everything in a lot of different tables and not consolidating those tables the way we're going to talk about today can cause a lot of problems for performance and make it harder to performance tune mainly because you might have to write some crazy DAX to get things to work. And many, many times, you guys know, I've done a three hour session on DAX. I have a DAX bootcamp coming up. I've been doing DAX for over 10 years, uh, actually about nine years, I think it is. But a lot of the problems in those VM calls and helping customers out when I'm doing DAX, the really complicated scenario of writing DAX, like complicated DAX usually is a result of a bad data model. Um, if you have a really good data model, writing DAX becomes a lot easier. We also, row-level security. Row-level security is pretty easy to implement, even dynamic row-level security inside of Power BI, if you have a solid data model. Now, Future Analytics says, hey, can we consolidate two fact tables? The answer is yes, you can have consolidated fact tables, but I generally recommend against that. So if I have a sales table and I have a returns table, I would generally create those as two separate fact tables, and I drill across those fact tables, Mr. Future Analytics, um, I drill across those fact tables by date, by product, by customer, whatever those related dimensions are. So generally speaking, you would keep them as separate fact tables because consolidating them actually does cause certain challenges in the future as well. All right, I won't be able to answer all the questions. There's zooming by over there, but if I see a couple I can answer, just so you know I'm watching, I'll do that. Um, all right, so good data model. Hopefully we're on the same page here. It's important. Everything is going to be easier and better if you have a good data model that is true now star schema you've heard of it it's been whispered of you've, you've you've crossed its path at some point in the past what is it what is the star schema the star schema is a way of building a data model that is designed for reporting purposes there are many different ways to model your data there are many different ways for different purposes if you connect to some kind of crm system dynamics 365 um, salesforce right if you connect to some kind of system like that, there's going to be lots and lots of tables and it looks crazy, but it's designed to support a very specific purpose, right? When we're building a data model for reporting and analytics, we're designing the model to make it easy to report from, to improve query performance. So there's some trade-offs there. The reason it's called a star schema is because when you surround your main table with your descriptive tables, it looks like a star right? All of your tables are essentially one join away from the fact table. So from a performance perspective, it's going to work really, really well. It's going to be scalable. Um, there are a lot of questions here about bridge tables. What are your thoughts on building bridge tables? A lot of times bridge tables are things like 
uh, dimension tables. Um, a fact table is a bridge table. It's a many to many bridge table. So bridge tables are absolutely necessary, uh, but you got to be careful with certain bridge tables if it's not necessary. So it's one of those it depends scenarios. We won't get into that today. We do cover it in our different classes. So this is going to be an example of star schema. Now, a snowflake, which I see some people mentioning here and Peter is referencing, a snowflake is when you start to normalize the data. So you start to have more and more tables. So the geography table filters through the customer table, filters down to the fact table. So now you have to go through multiple tables to get to your fact table. Generally speaking, we want to try to avoid this. Not that it's inherently bad in and of itself, but it again starts to complicate the data model, right? So we're trying to avoid getting in there and adding these additional tables if we can model it a different way. Right? So with geography here, I can potentially model geography so that I build the relationship directly to the fact. So now I don't have to go through my customer table or through my screening table. I can go directly to my fact and it's one join away. And so I'll talk more about that when we get to our actual practical example today in our Learn with the Nerds event. All right, so that is a snowflake and snowflakes start to look hard to consume, hard to understand because it's a lot of sometimes unnecessary tables that could have been consolidated. All right, so that's gonna be a snowflake schema. There's a couple of different model types that you can work through as you start to build your model. What I do when I'm working in a hackathon with customers or back in the day when I was doing consulting and we would go to different consult, you know, companies and help them build out their data models is generally I would start with a conceptual model, very high level, just a visualization of what we're thinking. So we could see all the different tables that were going to be involved in that model that we built, right? Then you get down into more specific details like the logical model. So I have my sales table. What are going to actually be the columns that are in that sales table? Transaction number, product key, you know, sales date, sales amount. What are going to be the actual columns in my product table? So that's more of a logical model that makes a lot of sense. Then we have our physical model. The physical model, specifically like in a database, is where you start putting things in there like the data types, if it's nullable, foreign key and primary key constraints and things like that. Today, we're going to be focused primarily on the conceptual and the logical model. And then the physical model is built in Power BI, but it's not like it is in a database. Kimberly says, does dim equal dimension? Yes, very astute observation, Kimberly. You have won yourself 50 Mitchell bucks for the presentation today. Good job. Dim does equal dimension and fact equals fact for fact tables. All right. So the conceptual model is going to look something like this. A lot of times I will use a conceptual model and I'll build a conceptual model in Excel, right? This week, Monday, I was doing a hackathon with a customer. I opened up Excel. I said, let's do it. And we started modeling out what the tables were that we thought were going to be necessary for the reports that they wanted, right? And then we went to their system that, of course, has thousands of tables across multiple ERPs, and we started pulling out the tables that we needed to, to really identify the columns that would be part of those tables. Now, in Power BI, usually building the data model is way less complex than that, right? It's an Excel file or it's a, some view somebody's already created for you. You just need to pull it in and then turn that into a, um, turn it into a data model. So on the next slide here, let's dive a little bit more into dimensional model concepts. So again, we're going to talk through some of these points before we dive a little bit more into it. So the dimensional model itself is, again, it is a very specific type of data modeling that is designed for reporting purposes, making it easy to retrieve data and making it easy to understand the data that we're trying to access, right? This has been around for a very long time, going back to the Data Warehouse Toolkit that we talked about with Ralph Kimball, and then of course the Star Schema. Pragmatic work, this is all we did for our first, you know, um, we've been around for 15 years as a company. For the first 10 years, we just did consulting and going to companies, helping them build data models and helping them to, to report on their data. A fact table is an event that may or may not include measures. Now, what I mean by that is there are different types of fact tables. Generally speaking, when we think of a fact table, we think of something very standard like a sale, a transaction, a line item on a transaction, right? So Mitchell went to this store on this date, bought this product for this amount and this quantity. That is a line item that we enter into our fact table for the purpose of recording that fact or that event. We also have factless fact tables, fact tables that don't have maybe measurable items like sales amount, a student taking a class. 
an interaction with a customer. We do a lot of work with healthcare companies and education, and a lot of times their fact tables don't actually have numerical data in it. They're doing a lot of counts and distinct counts and things like that. But it's tracking the event that occurred when they had an interaction with a member, whether it was a phone call or an in-office visit or whatever it might be. So there's different types of fact tables um, that are just relevant to different industries and different businesses. A dimension table, also known as a descriptive table, is a table that describes your data. So if I come to you and say, hey, we have $5 million in sales, you're going to say that is awesome and that is great. However, by what year? By what product? By what geography? By what customer? By what store? And as you start saying by what, that starts to identify our dimensions that we need to put into our model. Because in those dimension tables, we're going to have a, a, a group of related columns that will describe our data for us and give us more information, right? So those are going to be dimension tables. An attribute is just terminology that references a column, depending on what system you're in. But an attribute is a column in your dimension table that describes the data. Diving in a little bit more to fact tables, a fact table can contain measures. Sometimes it can be items that are already pre-aggregated if you build like an aggregated fact table. But they're, at, they're generally items we're going to aggregate in some way, whether it's a count, an average, a sum, a max, whatever it might be. And it's defining a business process, right? We're recording a business process that we want to measure. Examples might be things like claim, claim amount for an insurance company, screenings, which might have no measurable items, but it's more of event-based, total claims, cost, sales, any of those kind of things are examples of fact tables. And just for the sake of everybody else here, if you have an example of a fact table, put it in the chat window. We would love to see what your example of a fact table might be so everybody can get ideas of what fact tables would be. Measures are generally going to be sliceable, right, by year, by country, by state, by whatever. And then examples might be by month, by member, by customer, by geography, whatever it might be. So that's going to be your fact. Fact table, as we've talked about before, the fact is an event that may or may not include measures. One of the things that's very interesting about fact tables in general is that when we define our fact table, historically speaking, and you'll find this in the Ralph Kimball book, you'll find this in the Star Schema, we generally recommend that you store the data at the lowest level of information or what is known as the, the granularity is uh, very atomic, very detailed. The reason for that is because you can always roll up the data. You can always roll it up to the month level. You can always roll it up to the category. You can always roll it up to the store. But if you store it at the store level, you can't roll down. You lose descriptive capability. You lose what we call dimensionality. And I've been to customers. I've been consulting for a long time. I've been to customers who went through the process of building an enterprise data warehouse and they rolled it up to the day level because they didn't think they would ever need the individual transaction. And they realized after they released it to the end users that the end users started asking questions about the data that their model couldn't answer. And in those enterprise data models, you might spend six months or a year building out a very large data model. And I've been to customers where we've had to rebuild their entire data model because they did not plan that out ahead of time, right? And so you want to store it at the very most granular level of detail. However, this is a little bit of a challenge in Power BI sometimes because Mitchell, what do I do if I have hundreds of millions of rows, billions of rows of data, and I know I can't import all that into Power BI? Now I have to start looking at different options for optimizing performance, but getting all the data that I need. Can we do that? Yes. Yes, we can. There are some awesome options that are available to us to handle those types of scenarios, but that's why it's important to understand at the very beginning, how much data do you have? What are your business requirements? What are you trying to accomplish? We talked about that, right? All right, so that is granularity. A dimension table is descriptive, as we talked about before. It's descriptive and it contains those descriptive attributes that define how the facts should roll up. So I'm going to roll it up to the product, roll it up to the category, roll it up to the country, roll it up to the year, whatever those descriptive attributes are. Examples of this might be by month, by customer, by geography, and I threw out a bunch of other ones as we've gone through this as well. Laura said, been there, done that. Hopefully you're not talking about having to rebuild an entire data model, Laura. Uh, that's rough. That's a rough, rough time. 
Relationships are very important in Power BI. If you're not familiar with relationships, go take a look at my three hour DAX presentation because DAX is all about relationships, right? Every DAX calculation that we write is about the active relationships that are defined in the data model. And it is very, very important. Generally speaking, a relationship, an ideal relationship between a dimension to a fact should be a one to many. The one side of the relationship is the dimension. The many side is the fact table. And what that means is that the one side, whatever column you build a relationship on, date key, customer key, product key, geography key, whatever it is, in the dimension table, that column, the values should be unique. You never find a duplicate. In the fact table, it could show up multiple times because every time a customer buys a product, they get recorded in the fact table. So that's the many side of the relationship. So that's a one to many, that's ideal. I don't want to see in my data model a relationship where I have the date multiple times over here and the date multiple times here and I build it on a many to many relationship directly. That can cause problems. Should you have a date table in your data model? I see that conversation happening over here in the chat window. The answer is absolutely yes. That is going to make a big, big difference. Do not use the date directly from your sales table. Create a date table that has all of those relevant things and we'll kind of cover that quickly and briefly later on in the presentation. All right. So when we're talking about the dimensional model, it's going to be, look very, very similar to what you see on the left-hand side here, where you have your fact table and then you have your different dimension tables. A lot of people that are working inside of Power BI today come from an analyst background or come from working with Excel. And so what we see instead is what's called a highly denormalized database that looks like this. All of the columns, all of the data is in a very simple single table. And at its core, that actually can work really, really well. It can perform really well, but there are later down the road, you can run into storage problems. You can run into problems where it's not adaptable and flexible as you want to add more stuff to it. Um, so you want to build it out as a star schema from the very beginning. Also, it can make writing DAX very complex as well. So we want to build out a star schema, lots and lots of benefits there, including making it easy to understand. When we're talking about a dimensional model, and I'm going to keep using these terms so you get familiar with them. I've seen a lot of other people write blogs and YouTube videos over the years and they change the names. They try to make them easier. I don't think it's a hard to, to pick up. Um, when we're talking about a dimensional model, there's two types of tables. That's it. There's facts and there are dimensions. Now there are variations of these. There are aggregated fact tables. There are snapshot fact tables. There are accumulated fact tables. There are many different types of dimensions, no doubt. But again, in Power BI, generally speaking, you're not working with all of those different types of fact tables and dimensions because you're working with a much simpler data model than at the enterprise level many, many times. So now if we go down here to the next slide, the dimensions themselves define the who, the when, the what, the where, the why, and the how context surrounding the business process that we are measuring. Whether that's a sell or a claim or an interaction with a customer, that's what dimensions do. I think we've already figured that out. We talked about it. Let's go ahead and slide on to the next slide here. One of the things to know about dimensions when you're building dimensions is that dimensions generally are going to be very, very wide, meaning that they have a lot of columns. Because again, we're going to take a lot of tables that have related attributes or related columns, and we're going to join them together into a single table to get it more into that star schema that we're talking about. So they're generally going to be very wide. Also, as we talked about a moment ago with relationships, Generally, our dimension table is going to have what's known as a unique identifier or a surrogate key. We don't do this as much in Power BI as we do in an enterprise data warehouse, but it's a unique identifier on that table that doesn't necessarily relate back to the source system. So you might pull in from your product data, wherever that is, and it already has a key in there that's already unique. Well, for the purpose of data warehousing, a lot of times we'll add in our analytical warehouse, data warehouse, the new tables that we're building, we'll add another key that's 100% unique. Very interesting there. Um, there's the natural key. The natural key is that unique key that came from the original source system. The best attributes in a dimension table should be descriptive. You shouldn't have things in there like product code, right? Product code that says, you know, A, B, one, two, three. People don't know what that is. What I'm never going to use that in a report. So it doesn't necessarily need to be inside of my model, right? However, descriptive attributes are going to be awesome. Start date and end date you'll see a lot of times because that can be relevant for some more advanced scenarios and then flags. And I saw a lot of conversation here on date tables. Date tables always have a lot of flags on them. Is working day, is holiday, 
is weekend, those kind of things. And that, those flag columns are very, very important on your dimension tables because they actually help when we get into writing DAX later on. When we're trying to look at very specific scenarios, having those flags there make it a lot easier to filter your reports, make it a lot easier to write your DAX, make it a lot easier to do slicers and things like that. Peter, as always, I see you answering all these questions. You're doing awesome. Thank you, Peter, for your help. All right, so jump into the next slide here. Oh, that was it, demo time. Wow, that was quick. Came upon me faster than I thought. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna jump right in now and we're gonna start looking at the data that we're going to be working with today and we're gonna go through a practical example of how do we take this data and start to model it out into a star schema, pull it into Power BI, and then start scheming, uh, cleaning that up. And let's see if we have a couple questions here. Can we have more than one star scheme in the same model? That came from Fahad. The answer is absolutely yes, right? Because you can have multiple facts and those multiple facts would have their kind of be their own star schema within a model. So yes, good job. Are flags Boolean from Paul? Yes, they are. Generally, they are going to be a one or a zero. One equals true, zero equals false. Some people do yes and no, and that's okay as well if that makes a little bit more sense for you. I'm in accounting. What is a date table? A date table, Logan, is a table that has a list of all your dates, from the very first day that's in your data to the very last day. And then you can have a lot of other things in there like the calendar year, the fiscal year, the fiscal month, things like that. All right, tons of questions here. We'll dive into a bunch more later on. All right, so let me go ahead and hit that escape button right there. And then in your class files, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the student files and bring that over. And what I wanna talk about as we do this is as I always tell you, when I'm teaching and I'm doing these three hour events, I try to pack these things full with a ton of information for you. So I go a little bit faster through the demo. So if you're trying to follow along, it's probably not gonna be the best experience in the world. And that's why we record it and make it available to you and encourage you to go sign up for our boot camps and on-demand learning. So I am gonna go through it a little bit faster. I would encourage you not to follow along. If I look in the chat window and you're like, too fast, I'm gonna be like, I already told you, I warned you, I gave you a heads up. So I'm gonna go a little bit faster, but let's look at the data that we're gonna be working with today. So I have in the files that you downloaded, this Excel file right here. And this Excel file is a very flat table that has all of our data in it. So we'll give that a moment to load. And then uh, it's loading over here, it's thinking about it. This has actually got about 700,000 rows of data. So it's quite a bit, not a ton, but it's quite a bit of data. And I'm gonna bring it over. Now this is probably the most common scenario that I see. The users that we work with usually have these really big Excel files that have hundreds of columns and that's what they try to bring into Power BI and it doesn't really work. It causes all kinds of problems because Power BI is much different than Excel. So if I start with a model that looks like this, I want some help in the chat window and it is about 15 or 20 seconds behind, but start telling me what are dimensions that you see inside of this table right here. So what are dimensions that you guys see in this table? And I'm gonna open up another Excel file so that we can build out a logical model here. So we'll give it just a second. I'd love to get some interaction from the group here. All right. So first, while we're waiting for the lay, the delay and the lag in the video to catch up, the first thing that I notice is that each record in this table currently represents a transaction that occurred, right? So we know that the granularity of our fact table, just by looking at this data, is that one row in our fact table is going to represent a transaction that occurred by what? And when we get, oh, there we go. Product, customer, segment, awesome, date, geography. Man, you guys are crushing it. Great job. Yes, all of those are dimensions. 100% correct, right? So that's exactly right. And so let's kind of build out. I'll show you how I build out a conceptual model here inside of Excel. I generally go over to insert. You guys are still crushing it there. Customer, segment manufacturer i didn't see that one earlier good job so what i'm going to do is go into insert <clears throat> and under insert i'm going to tell it that i want to do smart art so let me go ahead and make it a little bit bigger right here and under smart art i'm just going to bring in something that i can work with like this all right now inside of this we can start identifying our conceptual model remember this doesn't have columns or anything like that but the first thing i have here is going to be my fact cells right we can see when I first look at this Excel file that each record pretty much represents a cell or a transaction that occurred. And so we get that. The next thing is we start identifying our dimensions, right? And so dimensions, you guys have already started saying them like date. Date is a very important dimension. 
that pretty much every data model should have. So we're going to have our dim date. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger here. Another dimension that we identified is going to be our customer. You guys brought that out, right? Dim customer. Geography is an interesting one. Let's talk about that in just a moment. Um, we're also going to have product because we're selling a product. So we want to be able to break it down by product, product, product category. So we'll have dim product here. And then another one that we're going to have is y'all mentioned campaign. I'm actually going to skip campaign for the sake of the presentation, but that is a valid dimension for sure. Normally I would add that in. I'm going to skip manufacturer also. We have category and segment that goes with product. We have geography. Geography is an interesting one. We'll come back. We also have customer. I forgot about customer here. So we have customer. Let's add that in. So this is going to handle, oh, I did do customer already. So let's see, we got dim customer product date. I think that is the majority of it from the beginning. We also have geography. I'm going to skip manufacturer. I'm going to skip campaign. That's going to be the majority of it. Now geography can go a couple of different ways and you can argue this point a lot. It could be that we take the geography and we just put it in the customer table. So we just put the city, the state, the region, the district for each customer. We track that in the customer table. So it just becomes more of the customer table and we filter from there. That, that has some pros and some cons. I won't go through all of them. Pros is that it might, it, it's good. It simplifies the model. I can filter from there. The cons is it might not be flexible, versatile for the future because in the future, I might have some other fact table that I bring in that doesn't track customer like inventory. That's a good example. We bring in a fact table that tracks our inventory levels and that table connecting to that, I might connect on geography, but it doesn't relate to customer at all. So now how do I build the relationship from dim customer to that table when that table doesn't have customer? So it might make more sense to actually have here my dim geography as a separate table that I relate directly to fact sales. Another way to do it, another way is you can actually relate dim geography through dim customer to fact sales and actually normalize this or snowflake this out a little bit. Again, none of those are inherently bad, but I'm just kind of talking through different ways to do it. All right. So that's going to be kind of our conceptual model. Now, that we've gotten that, let's pull it into Power BI and let's walk through and let's talk through how do we actually bring this all together. We got a question here, can we merge city and state? So I would keep them separate, but you could also merge them as another column just so that when you put it into like a visualization, a map visualization in Power BI, it has less chance of actually mapping it in correctly. So less ambiguity. So many, many times I do merge them together. Eric, let's see what you got here. Date, customer, manufacturer, product, dim category, dim geography. Yes. Category, we can move into the product table, but we're going to do it actually as a separate dimension. Good job. We'll talk about that here in just a little bit. You, oh, if I had more than four for this, Sue, you can just come over here and you can add them here. All right. So let's go ahead and move this back over here. I'm going to open up Power BI and we're going to actually jump into a practical demo, which is what everybody loves anyway, because that's how we learn. So I'm going to pull Power BI open and pull that over to our screen. Let me close that Excel workbook right there. Excel's a funny one. Sometimes when you're working with CSV or Excel files, if they're open, you can't really connect or do anything. And so what I want to do very briefly here is connect to that CSV file that's inside of our class files. And I'm going to go ahead and open that up. All right. And then of course we need to clean this data. So this is the practical way that you would do this. You say, Mitchell, I'm not an IT professional. I'm not, I haven't worked in business intelligence for years. I don't work with, you know, I don't work with things like SQL server databases. I don't know how I would break those tables up the way that you're saying. That's okay. That's great. I'm going to show you exactly how you can do this right here in Power BI and make this work. So the first thing that we're going to do is connect to your data, that big flat Excel sheet that you have, and then go ahead and click on transform data. When you click on transform data, you know, I know, everybody knows that is going to open up Power Query Editor and the Power Query Editor is specifically designed for cleaning transformation and curating your data, right? Michael said, would you add category as a separate dimension on the fact table or an extended dimension from the product dimension? 
I would actually, Michael, generally speaking, add the category into the product dimension. So I'd have the category, the subcategory, the description, all of that in the product dimension as one single dimension, generally speaking. There are other ways to do it, but that's how I would normally do it. In this class, in this session, I'm actually going to split it out and I'll show you why when we get there later on. So stay tuned for that. The dimensional model is a denormalized data model. Yes, it is. It's not fully denormalized like a flat table, but it's it's not normalized like third normal form, like you know, like ERP systems, CRM systems like that that are designed for different purposes. So yes, it is a denormalized data model. All right. So I'm gonna avoid questions for just a moment so we can dive in. Now, when you look at this table, this actually is very convenient for us because it already has a bunch of IDs and keys, but I'll talk about that here in just a moment. The first thing that I wanna do is over here on the left, we have our sales table. I'm actually gonna go ahead and give that a name. We'll call that fact sales. And I'm going to right click and I'm going to duplicate that table a couple of times. And I'll explain exactly what we're doing and why we're doing it here in just a moment. You can also use something known as reference. Reference is great, but you can't use reference if you're going to join back to the table, which many times when you're doing the process that I'm doing right now, you actually would uh, join back because it doesn't have a key. Like a lot of times your flat table doesn't have a customer ID. It just has customer information and you have to create a customer ID. A lot of times it doesn't have a product ID and you have to create it, which I'll show you how to do that here in just a moment. So I'm gonna go ahead and let's duplicate this one more time and this will get us a couple of our different tables that we want today now the next thing i'm going to do is go ahead and rename this one so let's build the product table first there was a lot of conversation there about product so kelly my table is about 700,000 rows i think so not too big sizable but not too big i'm going to right click right here let's go ahead and hit f2 and we're going to call this one our dim product table now once you're done with your model, generally speaking, I don't actually leave the prefix of dim in fact on my table names. I would remove those for the end user, but for the sake of the class, I'm gonna leave those in there so that everybody understands where our dimensions are and where our fact tables are. All right, so that's gonna be the dim product. And then what I wanna do is get rid of all the columns in here that are not related to the product, right? Because we're creating our product dimension. So up here at the top, I'll click choose columns. This is basic Power BI stuff, very powerful, very capable. And I'm gonna go down the list and get rid of everything that's not product related. So we're gonna keep product ID. We're going to keep our product name, category and segment are great. Unit cost and uh, unit price might be relevant per product. And then our, I think that ends up being it because that goes with the city. Yes, so we're gonna click okay. And that gets us this right here, much smaller table that only has the information that's related to product. Now the next step is we have a bunch of duplicates because we pulled this from the fact table. So each time a product was sold, it was recorded. We don't want duplicates in our dimension table as we talked about before. So I want to remove duplicates. So I'm gonna select all of my columns using the shift key, right click at the top and tell it that I wanna remove duplicate rows. And that's actually going to take it from being, well, it doesn't tell you in the Power Query Editor how many rows it is, but it's gonna reduce it a lot. So this just reduced a lot of the rows of data that we have. Again, you'll notice that we already have product ID, which will automatically join back to the fact sales table, but sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't actually have product ID, so you have to add your own. The way that I would add my own key if it didn't already exist is I would do it like this. I would go up to add column, and I would tell it I wanna add an index column, and I would click the drop down, and I would say from one. And so that will actually create a new column over here that starts with a value of one and automatically increments all the way down, giving me a unique value. Now, assuming that I did not have a product key, I'm giving you some extra stuff here. What I would now do is I'd have to merge back to my fact table. So I'd come back over to my fact table and I would join the two tables together and I'd bring the key from the product into this. So I would join them on product name. Um, product name is probably sufficient enough. I'd join on product name and add the product key back into this table. Very important step if you don't have that product ID. We don't need that, but we will later. So later I will have a practical example that we'll do. So this is a precursor, kind of building the foundation of what we'll talk about later in this class. I'm gonna come over here and re remove that index. Now, 
this table is done. There's really not a whole lot more to do. Later on, we're gonna break this out. Some of you mentioned a category dimension. We're gonna break it out and kind of snowflake this a little bit later on. This one right here, I'm gonna go ahead and name this. This is going to be my dim customer table. All right, so we're gonna build out a dim customer table. Just like we did with the product, the process is going to be remove all the customer, all the columns, all the columns that are not related to customer. We wanna go ahead and remove all of those, right? So what I'll do is come back up to the home ribbon here at the top and tell it that we want to choose columns, all right? And I'll go ahead and choose columns and then we're gonna get rid of all the columns that are not related to my customer. So we want customer ID, we want our, what else do we got? We don't actually have a whole lot here. We have our email name, we have city, state, region, district, and country. Now, this is actually a critical point where we have to make a distinction here. And I'll talk about it again. There's a lot of conversation in the Ralph Kimball book and the Star Schema book, even though I haven't actually read them in a few years. The geography could be kind of modeled out in a few different ways. And so you've got to plan ahead and know how might I build out my model in the future? Because when I'm building this out, so Jeremy's asking, what's the benefit of breaking out these? So why build a star schema? I would say go back and watch the recording if you joined a little bit late, because we talk about the importance of building out the star schema, flexibility, versatility, adaptability. Also, it's going to make things like security, performance, writing DAX easier by modeling it this way. And it's going to take up um, less storage. Do duplicate tables refresh when <clears throat> the master gets updated? When you refresh your data model, everything that's in the data model will refresh unless we turn it off and we're not gonna turn it off. So yes, it will. So we're gonna get rid of, I'm gonna keep geography. Now here's the thing. You can create geography as its own separate table, which gives you more adaptability and flexibility in the future if you add more fact tables, right? So you can directly filter to those fact tables on the geography. You could add it into the customer table so that you can just quickly filter down cells by customers that live in certain areas. Nothing wrong with that. You can also break it out into another table that filters through the customer table to the fact table so you don't have to store that geography key in the fact table. And all three of those are relevant ways to build out the geography table. In fact, I'm actually going to build a geography table and I'm gonna snowflake it just so you can see what that snowflake looks like. So I am not going to include city, state, region, district, or country. Just the zip code to relate back. So all I'm gonna keep is customer ID, zip code, and email name, and click OK. Again, we're gonna have a lot of duplicates in here because we're getting our list of customers from our fact table, and every time the customer was part of a transaction, we recorded that information. So now I can go across and grab all of my columns, right click, and then remove duplicates again. Again, we already have our customer ID, right? Customer ID is already here, so we don't have to worry about creating one. Let's make sure that step worked, and it did. So now the other thing I wanna do is let's break this out and get our email, our last name, and our first name. So some real quick data cleansing steps in the Power Query Editor. That's what I'm going to do now. All right, I see people talking about type two, historical dimensions. Getting crazy over there, Matthew. I didn't see the context behind that conversation though. All right, so I'm gonna right click here and I'm going to first of all split this column by delimiter. And I'm gonna split it by the, the, the colon here. So we'll say custom and it's gonna be colon and a space, just like that and I'll click okay. And that gives me two separate columns. I also wanna go ahead and split out my name into a last name and a first name column. So I'll split that out real quick, right? If you've ever worked in Power BI, you know how easy these act actions are. I'll right click split column by delimiter again, and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and tell it my big head might be in the way, apologies for that. I'm gonna tell it that we're gonna do custom and then we're gonna do comma space, and then we'll click okay one more time. So now we have our last name and we have our first name. Let me go ahead and rename those columns. I'll put spaces in here as a best practice, and then we'll do the same thing for the first name. So this is, I, I'm trying to keep this very simple so we're not doing a lot of data cleansing but this is definitely part of the steps. All right, so last name and first name. I also wanna clean up the email to get rid of any of these open and closing parentheses. So I will go ahead and David Hunt says third normalization form is the best for better modeling. I disagree, David, I disagree. Not for analytical and reporting purposes. It's way too normalized, way too many joins, way too hard to understand. 
I'm gonna right click on this and I'm gonna replace values. I'll get rid of, we'll do open parenthesis, replace with nothing. I'll do it again, right click, remove values. If you have replaced values, if you have never done this stuff in Power Query, you're getting a uh, real quick kind of breakdown of how to do these things. And so we'll call it email. So now we have this table that has our zip code, our email, our last name, and our first name. I noticed that zip code was turned into an integer. That's not good. So we got to fix that. That was probably on this step right here. Yep, right there. So I am going to go back over to my zip code, see if we can find it real quick, and we're gonna turn that back into a text value. Make sure if you're following along with this recording later that you're doing it, you're clicking on the change type and then coming over to the zip code here, changing that to a text. We'll do an insert and we're gonna replace the current. So we're gonna replace it, we're gonna get rid of the fact that it was turned into an integer and turn it back into a text value. A lot of times, integer values will have leading zeros on them so if you turn them into a number you lose that and globally they're not always numerical all right so definitely be careful with that all right so we can go back down to the very bottom step here and we now have our customer table now if we're going to build a geography table again there's a couple different ways to do it i have a way that i'm going to do it and i'm going to talk about that here in a little bit so I'm going to now build out our dim geography table real quick. We'll right click, rename this right here. And then I'm gonna call this one dim geography. All right, so this is another duplication of that fact table. And then I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of all the columns, again, that are not related to our geography. So I'll go up to the very top, we'll do choose columns, and then we'll get rid of all of the columns that are not zip code, city, state, region, district, and country. Now, the benefit of this, I think David said, you know, third normal form is good. So the benefit of third normal form is that third normal form reduces a lot of redundancy as far as storing data. The bad thing about third normal form is that as you build your model out in a way to reduce redundancy so where you're storing so that's kind of what i'm doing here by moving these out of the customer table you start to create a lot of extra tables generally and now i have to join from my geography through my customer through this through that to get there and that can cause performance problems that can cause difficulty writing dax that can cause complexities in your model and it can also make it very difficult to make that model adaptable as you add additional fact tables in the future so there can be a lot of debate there, but third normal form for dimensional modeling for analytical purposes, I would not, um, I would not consider the best practice. All right, so we'll click OK there. And that brings us back to here. Again, I need to take my zip code and make sure I convert that back to a string. This is something that Power BI does, so you gotta be aware of that. And I'm gonna go ahead and take that and turn it back into a text value, insert and then replace to take that and convert it back. So now we have our geography table. If I wanna relate this to the fact table, right? If I wanna relate this to the fact table, the fact table has a zip code in it. So I could hypothetically use the zip code. Ideally, I would prefer to create a key on this table and then relate it through the key, but that takes a little bit longer than we're gonna have in our presentation today. So I'm not gonna do that. But what I will do is I wanna get rid of all of the duplicate rows that are in here because again, we're going to have a lot of duplicates. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove duplicates. If you're noticing a very distinct pattern with what we're doing here, that's because it is. This is a very common pattern for taking data and actually building out your dimensional model inside of Power BI. And again, most of the models that I see are these kind of big flat tables that are coming from Excel or coming from views that some ERP system has provided. So the end user is used to looking at those views. So then we take those views and we break them out into this dimensional model that gives us a lot more of that flexibility. And I see desktop data crunching in here. That's Devin Knight, Mr. Devin Knight from Pragmatic Works joining us. So thank you for that uh, comment there. All right, so now we have our dim geography table that we have created. The other thing we need to create, very important here, and I gave it to Mr. Matt Peterson to share with the group, is we wanna go ahead and create a date table. There are a lot of awesome date tables created by the community that have hundreds of columns, just tons and tons of columns. I'm gonna actually go over here and I'm gonna pull up des desktop data crunching over here, Mr. Devin Knight. I'm gonna go to his website 
and I'm going to go down to Power Query, and I'm actually going to copy out some ILM code that Devin has here that I always use for my projects. It's a very simple ILM query that generates a date table and generates it with quite a few necessary columns, but it's not too much. So I'm going to copy this out. Matt will drop the URL, the link to this in the chat window. So you guys will have access to that if you want that later. So let me go ahead and copy this and then I'll pull that back over. And I am going to create a new source and I'm going to do a blank query. So a blank query is if you wanted to write Elm query yourself. Everything we're doing in Power Query Editor, every click, every transform is actually creating Elm query in the background. And generally the UI does a really great job at that. But from time to time, you might actually want to write your own Elm code. Uh, and it's very, very powerful language. So we're going to do a blank query here. And when I get my blank query, I'll go into the advanced editor, delete everything there, and then paste in the code that I copied from Devin's website. Then I'll come down to the bottom and click done. And that's going to create something known as a function. And when I run the function, it'll actually create another object in here that's a table. So I think this data goes all the way back to 2011. So I'm going to do 1, 1, 2011. I'm going to go all the way back and then I'll go to the end of this year like so. You can go into the future. Matt Peterson and I were looking at a really odd scenario the other day where a customer was getting some really weird results and it's because their model was in the future. So when they were doing like current year and year over year for multiple years, the numbers were the same. And it was the same because they had built their data model to go into the future. So you can get some odd results if you plan ahead and you go into the future. But a lot of people do future proof their model and go 10 years ahead. So they don't have to worry about coming in here and updating the date table every year. So that's something to think about, something to consider. I'm going to click invoke. When I click invoke, it creates a date table. I'll give that a nice, awesome name. That'll be our dim date. And then I'll have to go ahead and change the data types real fast. Date, that'll be a whole number. That's going to be a text, another whole number. Very important to go through this step because these ABC one, two, threes that you see here are actually notified as like an any data type, meaning Power Query is confused. It didn't properly give them a data type. So I'm gonna go through and just modify them very, very quickly here. All right, basic stuff, but important stuff. Now. We now have our date table that we can relate back. Now you might be noticing, right, that there's a lot of stuff that's actually missing from my date table. And some of those items are gonna be things like fiscal year, fiscal month, month number of year, is weekday, is holiday. Very important things that a lot of times when I'm working with customers, we actually wind up adding into the model to make it easier to build our reports and to make it easier to author more complicated DAX scenarios that they have. But this is a very simple model that gives us what we need for analytical purposes. Now, the next part that I want to cover here is taking a look at what this looks like in the data model and then talking about how we can come back and add additional, um, adding additional tables to our model. And then that'll get us to a very good point where we can take our break right here in the middle of the session today. So I'm going to go ahead and jump back over to up here at the very top. And I'm going to go ahead and click close and apply, which is going to close the data and load it into my data model. Generally speaking, I like to actually save the model first. So let me go ahead and save it and I'll call this. I'm going to do save and I'm going to say apply later. The reason I do apply later is so that if it happens to crash, I at least saved all the work that I did. Now I'll hit close and apply. Just in case, I, I, actually in my DAX video, if you guys saw that, I actually had something happen right before break where it broke and I had to go back and fix it. KD said, you called ILM language what? Um, it's actually, it used to be known as the Power Query Formula language, but everybody called it ILM language. So then they um, just renamed it ILM officially. Do you have a recommendation for a good Power Query ILM language book? I do have a book. It's probably the best one that I have heard of or seen, and it's this one right here. I never read it. It is smells very, very clean because I just don't find myself doing a lot of ILM query, to be honest with you. There's a lot of other ways to clean and transform the data, but that's probably the book I would recommend. There was one before that called ILM is for Data Monkey or something, um, and that was pretty straightforward, but this is probably the book, that book right there. All right, so the model has been loaded. Whenever you load your data into the data model, the first thing that I want to do is go take a look at those relationships and make sure the relationships have been defined and built the way that we expected them to, right? 
So I'll go over to the model view. And in the model view, I can start to kind of see if this is going to look like a star schema. Now you're going to notice right out the gate, and we're going to have to make some modifications to this. So we're going to be diving into some of these other conversations and concepts once we get back from our break. But I already have this snowflake that's starting to occur right here where geography filters through dim customer through the fact to the fact table. Again, we could model this differently. I'm going to go with this for the purpose of this session. I also need to build a relationship from my date table to my fact cells. If you're not aware of this, I'm going to show you something real quick. If I come over to my model, my report view, and I build a very simple visualization here, that is going to be my year. Let's do year here and we'll make sure it's not summarized. And then I bring in from my fact sales table, my total sales. Let's see if we can find that real quick. I think it's unit price. There we go. You're going to see that we get a duplicated value all the way down. Now I talk about this in some of my other presentations. I know I talk about this in my three hour DAX presentation, but this right here shows me the same values all the way down, which tells me something is wrong with my active relationships in the data model. It doesn't exist. It was built incorrectly. It's not working the way I thought it was supposed to be working. Something's going on. And so this is what we're talking about when we talk about how we want to have those active relationships because they will automatically do filtering and grouping and those kind of things for you automatically inside of your model. So I'll come back over to the report view. And in the report view, I'm going to build that relationship from the date table over to the fact table on the date column. Sometimes you'll have a date key. If you have a date key that's like an um, integer value, so it's not an actual date, you want to make sure you mark your date table as a date table. But I'm going to come back over to the report view. And now it's working correctly, right? It's automatically filtering based on the active relationship in the data model. So this is looking at our model. This puts us in a really good place. Now, we're actually doing incredibly great on time, even with answering questions. So what I want to do is I want to dive in and talk about multiple fact tables and what that looks like. It's very common to have multiple fact tables. Let's just think about this for a moment, right? If I come back over here and I look at my report, we have a pretty standard data model. But you might have other fact tables that you want to add to this. Things like we have, we have sales, but we also have returns. Returns is a separate fact table, right? Returns is a separate fact table where um, I would build that into my model. So if I had a fact table here called returns, somebody asked about this earlier, would that still be a star schema? And the answer is essentially yes. Now in my fact returns table, I'd build a relationship to my date table. I'd build a relationship back to my product table. I'd build a relationship back to my customer table. And it would have, really, it'd be sharing the same dimensions that my fact sales table has. This is important. So in the dimensional modeling world, when we build our dimensions, we want to build those dimensions so that they conform across the multiple source systems, but also so that they conform across our different fact tables. So we could build a fact returns table, and I would not consolidate this. I would keep this as a separate table. What are some other examples of tables we could build in here? Well, we could also build a fact table that might be inventory levels, right? That would be very common to have some kind of fact inventory. Another one that I come across a lot is budgets, forecast, right? We're trying to forecast what it should have been for this year. So what, what should have been our total sales for this month, for this year, for this product? That's a very interesting one. So that right there would be fact budgets or fact forecast, whatever it might be, right? And so that is another fact table. And so it's very common that, yes, zoom it is what we're using. Zoom it, zoom it. Good job, Katie. So um, it's very common that in the future, you're going to want to add additional facts in here because now you can find out how much did we sell? How much do we have in inventory? What was our forecast? Are we on budget? Are we on plan? Are we on goal? Are we on target, right? Like all those questions we want to answer. That's why at the very beginning, we have to know what it is we're trying to measure and what we might be trying to measure in the future so we can start building our model that's going to be good in a way to be flexible and versatile, if that makes sense. So what I have inside of our class files is I have another file in here called fact budget. Now, the original format of this that we actually cover in our class that was originally from a Microsoft class that we teach in collaboration with Microsoft was 
a crazy file that requires a lot of data cleansing. So I was unsure of timing, so I went ahead and cleaned it all up. But I'm going to go ahead and bring in the fact budget. Now, I'm going to open it up first, and I want somebody here to tell me what do you see that's different. The date looks weird in here. I'm not going to mess with that. You're not actually going to be able to answer this question, so I'll just tell you. This table tracks a combination of category and segment at the day level, and it gives you a forecast or a budget for that category, that segment at that day level. So actually, it's at the month level. And so this is, this is very important because this is a different level of granularity, a different level of detail than our fact table. So that's a lot. That's a lot. Let me close that down. I'm going to bring that data in real quick. Let me make sure that it was a CSV file, and it was. All right. So I'm going to bring in that CSV file real quick by going up to Get Data at the top, and I'm going to go ahead and do text forward slash CSV, grab that file, and then do Open. All right. All right, so let's talk about this. I'm going to bring it into the Power Query Editor just in case I need to clean the data because I don't quite remember. So this fact table, like I said, it had a lot of work that needed to be done. I already did it. But a lot of times when you get like aggregated fact tables or budget tables or even inventory levels, a lot of times they are rolled up to a higher level. This is a really, really important concept. If you look at this, you'll see that urban convenience for the forecast is being stored at the month level. So we're forecasting it at the month level, not the day level. Nobody said, hey, we expect that, you know, for this category, for this segment, for mountain bikes, for bikes, mountain bikes, for January 1st, we're gonna have $1,200 in sales, right? Nobody, nobody does it at the daily level generally for budgets or forecasts. We do it at the monthly level, we do it at the yearly level. The problem with that is, it's at a different level of detail than what's in your fact table. Now, in my advanced DAX class, in our online training, and in our advanced Power BI class, I kind of talk about how to model this out and how to write the DAX to solve that problem if I'm looking at like July 15th. If I'm looking at July 15th and there's 31 days, how do I take the monthly forecast and break it down to only 15 days within the filter context so I can see if I'm on track or not? Very important. That's something that's a little bit more advanced that we cover in some of our other classes. But you'll notice that I don't have a product here. We're not doing it at the product level. We're doing it at a higher level, at a subcategory level, right? And so I can't build a relationship directly from my product table to this table. Like there's not a possibility really for me to do that because it doesn't exist because this is at a higher level of granularity. So when you roll a fact table up, when you create like an aggregated fact table, so you, you roll it up to the day level, you roll it up to the month level, when you do this, you lose dimensionality. I cannot filter this any longer by the individual product because it's not here. We lost that dimensionality. That's why you got to be careful, especially with like your primary business process rolling it up because you can lose that descriptability. And that's what causes a lot of people to have to go back and literally have to rebuild their data model from scratch because you can't go back and change all of that. So in order to build this relationship so that I can drill across from fact cells to fact budget, this is where we need to build out that category dimension that many of you caught and many of you mentioned earlier when we were going through our initial kind of phase of looking at the data. So generally speaking, I would build my category into the product table. I would generally do it that way. However, now that I'm looking at this data here, I realize that if I break out the category into its own dimension, I can filter both the fact budget table and our fact cells from that one dimension and drill across, which is very important, right? So here's what we're going to do. That's a weird, John, that, that, that formatting that you see there is just a weird um, Excel thing. So I'm not messing with that too much. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna make this into a date. We're going to take our break. Our break is gonna be 15 minutes long. And when we get back, I'm gonna show you how to build the category segment dimension. And then we're gonna get into some other concepts and things that we wanna talk about specific to data modeling with Power BI. Some really cool stuff that we're gonna have when we come back from our break. All right, so I'll see everybody back here in, oh, that messed up. Hmm, let's see if we get rid of that. Change that over to a date real quick. Hmm, I'm gonna fix that in a minute. I'll re-import that while we're on a 10 minute break or 15 minute break. See everybody back here in 15 minutes.
All right. Hello and welcome back. Quick but much needed break there. We're going to dive right back in and I was looking through some questions. So we're going to talk about some of those questions here as we dive back into it. And Matt let me know that I had actually forgot a critical step because I don't actually have very specific notes here. In fact, I have no notes. I'm just kind of walking through what I knew I wanted to talk about today. And so I'm going to pull back over, <clears throat> excuse me, our Power Query editor. And there's a couple really important questions I want to talk about. First of all, let me fix our original fact table. So if I go back over to my original fact table, once we duplicate that and we break all, all of our different dimensions into separate tables, we then need to come back and just remove all of those extra attributes and columns that we don't need inside of our fact table. We don't need them there anymore, right? So I'm going to go through and remove a bunch of that information. So I'll do choose columns here. I think somebody asked about that. And so I'm going to go down the list and I'll get rid of, we need product, all of our ID columns we need. We didn't keep campaign, so I'll get rid of it. I'm going to keep product goes, segment goes, because we can get all that information from the product table, right? Manufacturer goes, we'll keep unit cost and price because that'll give us our cost and our sales. Zip code is going to go email, city, state, region. There we go. So very, very small. A lot of times fact tables are not very wide but they have a lot of rows. All right, so I'll click OK. And then before I forget, I have a very special thing that I want to share with the group here today, and it is primarily uh, just thanking Peter for his contributions in all of these trainings. And so, Peter, you are going to be awarded with the Certificate of Top Technological Superiority. It's awarded to you for earning the distinct honor of accruing the most Mitchell Bucks. So if you want that, I'll send it to you in PDF format. You can put it on your LinkedIn, put it in the office, in the break room. I'll send it to you. Just send me an email. But we thank you for your contributions uh, in the chat. Now, we're getting a lot of questions about data modeling, a lot of awesome questions. Maybe we can do some kind of follow-up event where we do a Q&A. That would be awesome. So let us talk about that internally and keep your ears out for that. What I would like to do now is kind of dive into what I heard about type two dimensions. Type two dimensions are a little bit advanced. I had to do this all the time when I did, you know, data modeling for customers and consulting. What a type two dimension is or a historical dimension is, it's this idea that when something changes in the dimension, you want to track history. That is great. That's one of the big benefits of a dimensional warehouse where your original relational uh, data warehouse doesn't normally store that information, right? So we are going to in my, let's give an example, in my product table, if the price of a product changes, I want to be able to go back and historically look and say, how much of that product did I sell at this amount versus this amount? What was the quantity? What was my gross profit margin? All of that, right? That is historical information. So what you do is every time, and this goes back to a very key concept, it's a little bit more advanced, but I'm going to introduce it to answer some questions. This goes back to actually adding into your table what's known as a surrogate key, a unique identifier that is different than the original ID column that came from your source. So if you think about this, in this product table, we have an original ID column right here that came from the source. And right now we've been using that as our relationship to the fact table. However, based on the questions we've been getting from KD and others, if you want to track historical information, you can't use that key to join back to your fact table. Instead, you have to actually create a surrogate key in your dimensions. So what will normally happen is I would come in here and sort my data in some very specific way. So maybe I sort it by um, usually some kind of date. So if you have a date on here, remember we talked about like start date, end date. If I could sort this table, first of all, by a start date, that can kind of enforce consistency so my surrogate keys don't change in the future. Somebody asked about that. But you would have a date normally on. If you have a historical, you'd have a start date, end date. I would sort it by the start date, end date. In this case, we'll sort it by product key. So I'm going to sort right here. I'm going to sort this in ascending order on my product ID. All right. And then once you do that, we now have to create an SK. And the SK is what we store back in our fact table, not the product ID. So we'll do that the way we talked about earlier. You go back up to the top, add column, add an index column starting from one. And this becomes my product SK. Now let me talk about that just a little bit more. This is getting a little more advanced than most people care about for Power BI, but I'm trying to answer the question. We'll call this my product SK. 
if you have a product that changes price and you want to track historical information on that price, then that product ID will now show up in this table twice. It'll show up once for $10 and it'll show up again when the price changed to $11. So that product ID is no longer unique. So it no longer gives us that one-to-many relationship that we talked about earlier that we wanted back to our fact table, right? So that's one of the main reasons why we do the surrogate key like we talked about a moment ago. So this is what I would store in my fact table. Now, because my fact table doesn't have that, what I would actually have to do is join back to my fact table. Very interesting. I'm thinking through this as I talk. I join back to my fact table on whatever makes a row unique. So that would be product ID. And then you'd have to, I actually have a YouTube video on this next part. Uh, maybe we can put that in the description or something later. We'd have to do a range lookup. When did the product sell? And then you'd have to look up to this table because remember a product shows up in this table multiple times for each list price. So then you'd have to join back to this table and you'd have to say where the start date, the date of the sold product is between the start date and the end date of the product here to get the ID to add back to the fact table. This is all part of, you know, ETL here, this, this kind of idea of extracting, transforming, loading data and getting the dimensions in the fact tables correct. I don't see this a lot, this idea and this concept of type two historical dimensions. I don't see that a lot in Power BI, but that is effectively how you would deal with that. If you go take a look at our on-demand learning online and you look at my data modeling class, that is very specific to dimensional modeling in general. Again, I created that class years ago. I probably don't have a goatee in there, but the, the concepts have been relevant for years and I would talk about this there, I'm sure. All right, so that's not for everybody. That's extra, that's free, no charge, thanks to the questions from KD and others. So that covered our fact table, cleaning it up. We would not remove duplicates from the fact table because everything in there should be legit. Why not unit cost? In the, so I left unit cost in the fact table, Dennis. I actually left it in there. It should still be there, right? Because that gives me my cost. Yeah, I still have it there so I can quickly figure out my total cost, total um, sales, and then gross profit and things like that. So I actually still have it. All right. So now the next thing I want to do is let's talk about how to build a relationship to fact budget. I'm going to hit close and apply so you can see the problem that we currently have when we bring in the fact budget table. And I appreciate all the positive comments in the chat window. That's awesome. Glad you guys are enjoying it and having a great time. That is our goal. We love training at Pragmatic Works. Brian, Devin, myself, Manuel, our team, we used to be consultants. And when we sold consulting, we were very happy to keep the training company and keep doing this because we really love training um, people to do this. So now I have my fact budget. I can build a relationship to the date table on the date and that right there is fine, right? But how do I build this relationship over to like my product table? I can't, right? Because I have product ID, but we're not tracking our budget at the product level. We rolled it up to the category. We rolled it up to the segment. So this is where I have to do what you guys mentioned earlier in the class where you said, let's build a category dimension, right? And so we'd have category that filters product that filters sales. So it is also kind of going more towards normalization. It's going more towards snowflaking than a star schema. Again, there are multiple ways to model this. So I'm going to show you a way to model it. It doesn't mean that I would necessarily model it this way myself. It would depend on other criteria and other requirements that I gathered during that gathering requirements phase when talking with the customer, looking at existing reports and seeing what all was relevant there. So here we go. We're going to go back into the Power Query Editor and build yet another critical dimension for our data model. So I'm going to go back over to our transform data. And in the transform data, we are going to, I'm going to actually, I could do this a couple different ways. I think I'm going to duplicate the work that I've already done here. So I'll right click on dim product to duplicate that table. And from dim product, we're going to create a, a dim cat segment table, category segment. So we'll give that a name. All right. And so this is only going to be every row in my dim category segment table is going to represent one combination of category and segment, right? So it's going to be unique. That's going to be my unique identifier. So I'm going to grab category and segment, right click, and I'm going to remove all the other columns because we don't need that. That's step one. Those columns are out of here. Now, once those columns are gone, 
we're going to now add a surrogate key. We're going to add a unique identifier on this table so that we can come back. So we do need to remove duplicates before I forget. There we go. If you wanted to sort them first alphabetically or what have you, you can sort them before adding your surrogate key. But I'm going to go over to add column, index column from one. We did this before kind of as a precursor to this module earlier in this session today. So now I have my index. That part is awesome. And we're going to call this our, uh, I would normally call it something like cat seg, whatever the name of my dimension is, you know, key or SK or whatever. So I'll call it SK. So now I have my key. Now here's the deal. I need to join this SK back to my product table because the way this is going to look so we can all be very clear is you have your category that filters down your product that filters down your sales table. So what key relates your category segment to your product table so that it can filter it down accordingly? Well, it's the surrogate key, but remember our product table don't have the surrogate key. So how do we get that key into the product table? That's what we haven't done yet in this session. So this part is really important. Let's do it together. So I'm going to go back up to the top and I'm going to go over to my product table and I'm going to do a join back to this. So we'll go over to home and we're going to do what's called a merge. A merge is like a VLOOKUP in Excel or a join in SQL. We'll do a merge and I'm going to say merge queries. Now, this is why I've been doing duplicate. If I would have done a reference, it won't let you merge back because it's dependent on that item. So then you get this weird circular dependency issue. But if you duplicate it, you can join back, which is what we needed to do. I'm going to tell it that I want to join from my product table over to my dim cat segment. And we have to join on category and segment in both tables. So what makes a row unique is the combination of those two. All right. We'll do a left outer is fine. Inner join really would be sufficient here, but we'll do left outer. And then I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And that's going to, if you've ever done a merge in the Power Query Editor, that's going to give us a new column here that has a table. And we tell it, all right, from that table, return these columns and return these rows of data, right? So that's the next step that we're going to look at here. So now I'll go over to expand and tell it what columns I want to return. I don't need category or segment. We already have that in our table. We don't need that. We only want to bring back the category segment key right there. So then I click OK. And now we have that category segment key in our product table. So this is how you build those dimensions out if you don't already have the ID. Also, as many of you astutely noticed earlier in the class, we need to go in and remove from this table we can now get rid of category and segment because we don't need it here. If I want to filter from category or segment, I filter from my category table. So I can go in here and say, you know what, let's go ahead and right click and remove columns and we're good to go. All is right with the world. Now, we've done that. This is now going to relate over, relate over to our fact budget table, which also we need to join it to that one. So this table will also have the key. So we got to do the same exact process again, because right now I can't really filter from my dimension to this table because this table does not have that SK there. So now, oh, what is on demand learning? What a great question. So on demand learning is recorded classes that we have. We have over 70 recorded classes on our platform on Azure, Power Apps, SQL Server, SSIS, of course, Power BI, data modeling. So it's online learning that you have access to for a full year if you purchase it and you can go through and watch them as many times as you want over and over again. So that is on demand learning. All right. So we got our fact budget here. I'm going to do another merge. We're going to merge our segment table over to this one. And we're going to join on category and segment so that we can get the key into this table. There we go. We'll click OK. And then I'm going to expand that right there. And we are going to return only the category segment key. That's what we want. And then again, once we get that key in this table, we no longer need the category or the segment so we can remove it from the table, reducing that redundancy. How did you fix the date issue in the fact budget? Oh, I split it out, Gary. I just did a um, split. So I came up here, split by delimiter, split it out by the space to get rid of the time. And then I was able to convert it to a date. Sorry about that. Super quick. All right. I am going to 
get rid of these two columns right here because we got our key. So that looks great. Right click and remove columns. Beautiful. This gets us where we want. So let's go back and load the data into the data model. Take a look at what we got. And then we still have about another hour that we'll talk about some other concepts that I want to dive into today. So if I hit close and apply, we should have our new dim category segment table. We'll build the relationships and then I'll talk about how that relates to another fact table, right? The fact budget table that we brought in as soon as it's done loading here in just a second. Let's see if we have any questions while we are waiting. So Steve, that's an interesting question. It's very rare to filter down a DIM table to records that you don't need. Generally, you'd have to look at the number of, you know, if I'm only bringing back the last two years of data from my fact table, then maybe get a distinct list of you know, the keys that are in your fact table and do an inner join to the dimension. The inner join will automatically get rid of all those other ones and only bring in those relevant keys. That's probably the best way because you got to be careful filtering down dimensions because if you filter down a dimension, then you don't have a match in the, the table and you get blanks when you start to, to do group buys and filtering, right, Steve? So I would say look at your fact table, get a distinct list of your product key, get a distinct list of your customer key for whatever the time frame is then you can use that list, do an inner join to the dimension. Inner join, of course, only brings back the rows that match on both sides of the join. That would get rid of those extra ones and then bring in only those rows to Power BI. So I would clean it up in SQL. I would do that in SQL for sure. All right, guys. So now if you look at this, we have our category segment table that filters down our DIM product, that filters down our fact cells, and then we have our fact budget that is being filtered by both DIM category and DIM date. Now, a lot of people will start to mistake adding additional fact tables into the model as, you know, normalizing the model or turning it into a snowflake, but that's not necessarily true. In fact, one of the really cool things about Power BI is we can kind of look at a diagram of our separate fact tables, right? So if I come down to the bottom right here, I can add a layout, they're called layouts, and I can call one called fact cells. And in this layout right here, I'm going to bring in those relevant tables just so we can, you know, as your model grows and your model should, if you build it really well from the beginning, it'll grow. You'll have an opportunity to continue growing that model and adding in flexibility, versatility, so on and so forth. Right. And so I'm going to add in a couple of our tables here real quick. We'll add that in. We're going to bring in our customer and then we'll bring in our geography. So this right here is our fact table and how it is related to the dimensions in the model that are related to that table. Right there. So that's a layout for fact cells. Now I'm going to create another layout real fast that's just for the fact budget. So I'll go back over here and click right there. And we'll do fact budget. And we're getting trolled by David again. Um, with his third normal form. Absolutely not third normal form, David. Uh, we're going to go over here and bring in our fact budget and then I'm going to bring in a couple of dimensions. So the dimensions that were related to this was the DIM category segment and the date. I did not change the data model. I did not change the relationships or anything like that. All I did just now was say this is an easier way to look at the data and understand it, right? So I can understand the relationships that are in my model, which are very important when you get into writing more complicated and more advanced DAC scenarios. Now, what I want, oh, that's cool. Carlton, I didn't know that. I did not know that. Let's test that out. Carlton says, might have to take that, um, how do I remove it from this one? There we go, remove from diagram. If I right click on this, add related tables. There you go. Good job, Carlton, I like it. Good job. All right, so what do I wanna do next? I want to show you guys some other things about just data modeling in general that you should be aware of. I'm going to go back over to the uh, report view here. And in the report view, what I want to do in the report view is I want to go ahead and build a couple of very quick measures. Now, by the way, for those of you who are kind of following along and looking at the stuff here, if you pull up the class student files and you look right here, you'll notice that I have the starting file 
I have the completed file, and then I have the completed file with DAX. So there are different versions of the files that you can open up and you can look at if you're going back through this at a later time and you're following the recording, all right? So let me go ahead and slide that back over right there. Kevin said, classes are out of date. So they're actually, right now, Kevin, we're in the process of updating both the Introduction to Power BI class and multiple other classes. So unlike a lot of other training platforms, we actually do re-record the class. I think Power BI we're re-recording for like the 15th time because the UI does change. Many classes don't necessarily change, right? Like SQL, writing SQL, writing, you know, data modeling. So those don't get updated as often, but the Azure ones and the ones on Power BI, we unfortunately have to update very often. So we have team members doing it. Manuel Quintana, right now this week is updating the introduction to Power BI class. All right. So I am going to do what? Create a couple measures. Let's create a couple measures because I want to show you something really, really cool that we can do with our data model inside of Power BI. And this is going to introduce, actually, I forgot to add it, but I'm going to add another column in a minute. So let me create, actually, I want to talk about something first. I forgot to add my column. I want to talk about something known as role playing tables. A lot of companies have role playing tables, even if you're not quite sure what they are, right? So a role playing table is where you have a date, maybe a date that you want the date to play the role of the order date, the ship date, or the due date. Or you have an address and you want the address to play the role of the bill to, the ship to, um, and the invoice to, right? Different um, maybe geographical locations. And so I build a model and everything in my model is predicated off of the order date. So marketing loves that, sales loves that. But then my manufacturing team or my production team or my shipping team, they come over and they say, Mitchell, I wanna see sales and quantity sold and all of that. I wanna see it based on the shipping date. And if you know Power BI and you understand the active relationships in the model, you know that the filtering that occurs and the grouping that occurs automatically happens on the active relationship. And our active relationship right now is predicated on the order date, right? So let me fix this and cause a problem that we can then fix. So we're gonna cause a problem we can fix. I'm gonna go back over to the home tab, go back into transform data, and I'm gonna go into my fact table, and we're gonna add another column here. In fact, let me, let me make this a date, first of all, and then I'm gonna call this order date. So this will be the order date, the date that it was purchased, and then I'm gonna add a new column on this table inside of Elm using the Elm query language. I'm going to write a custom column here. We'll call this one our ship date. And we're just going to hypothesize that every time the ship date is going to be three days after the order date, right? So we'll do something like date dot add days. And then let's see what the IntelliSense tells me. I think you have to bring in your order date first and then the number of days. I was hoping IntelliSense was gonna help me out here, but no such luck. It looks like that's gonna work. Oh, nope, date is not. How's that getting passed? All right, I think that's it. 729, perfect, all right. So I created a table that is a little bit, a column that's a little bit different, right? So 729 is the ship date, order date is 726. So this is gonna cause a problem for us. Let's go take a look. This is gonna be great. So if I go back over to home, I'm gonna do close and apply, load the data again, and then what we're looking at right here, right? If you look at this table, this table is representative of the total sales by the order year, the year that it was ordered because the relationship in our model is based on the order date. In fact, very important to understand that by going back and looking at it, right? So if I look at my dim date table right here, Oh, wrong one, sorry about that. We gotta go over to our actual fact sales table. If I go over here, you'll see that the relationship is from date to order date. So the filtering occurs on the order date and that's what I wanna take a look at now. So when I'm looking at this right here, I see the relationship. So look at the numbers, right? 10, 5, 95. Now if I go over to my model and I change my model over to the ship date because you know they say, hey, we wanna see it based on ship date. So I change that over and click okay and I come back over here, is it still 10,595? No, it's not. It's not 10,595. Now the number has changed and it's changed because now we're filtering on a different column. We're filtering on the date that it shipped, not the date that it was ordered, okay? So how do you get both? How do you get the best of both worlds? I have one 
team that wants order date, one team that wants due date, one team that wants ship date, one day team that wants invoice date and paid date. How do we get them both to work here? Well, there's a few different ways of handling that. I'm going to show you a really cool method. I have a YouTube video on this. Matt actually has the YouTube videos. Matt, if you can drop that in the chat window so people can go back and look at that later. And it says I'm out of focus. So let's see if we can, um, how would I even fix that here? Did I refresh? Hmm. Let me see. I don't want to spend too much time on that. Let me get out of here. Unfortunately, let's go back to full picture in picture. It's still out of focus. Mm. Short of kind of turning it off and turning it back on, which I can't do right now. I'm just going to be out of focus a little bit. So we'll go full because that's aggravating. All right. So what I want to do is let's go ahead and talk about how you would solve this problem, generally speaking. First of all, let's build a couple of very quick measures. For those of you who are following along, again, be aware that following along is not necessarily the, the best option here because I am going to go a little bit faster, but I'm going to create three measures on this table. So I'm going to go and create a new measure that will be called total sales. So this will be my total sales measure, which is going to equal the sum of my fact sales and then unit price, right? So that'll be the first measure that we create. And we know that that right there represents the total sales from my fact table within the current filter context, which from my date table is the order date, right? So we'll go ahead and give that a format of English United States. There we go. And then I'm going to create another one real quick. So let's create another measure on this table. This is going to be called my total cost. That's going to equal the sum of my fact sales, unit price, unit cost. There we go. We'll do that. And then we'll format that one as well. And then let's build two more quick measures. So the next one's going to be total transactions. Total transactions is going to equal count rows. So I'm just going to count all the rows from my fact sales table within the current filter context, of course. We'll give that a thousand separator. And then just for the heck of it, because everybody loves time intelligence, I'm going to build a year to date sales calculation. So we'll build one more measure on this table and this will be our year to date sales. And that's going to equal total YTD, our measure of total sales. And then we'll pass in the date column from our date table. All right, and we'll make that a currency as well. There we go. All right, so the reason I'm building a couple of measures is because I wanna show everybody kind of what this looks like once we start to put this into our visualizations, right? So if I bring in total sales, total cost, and then total transactions in year to date sales, all of these measures are being filtered by this year right here. And that year is now my ship year. Remember we changed it from order year over to our ship year, right? So <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and switch that back real fast. And we're gonna switch it back over to order date and then click OK again. Now, there's a couple ways to handle this. One of the ways that you can try to handle this is you can try to handle this by essentially going in here and I'm gonna try to turn on picture in picture again. Oh, I'm back in focus, perfect. Um, you can go back in here and you can handle this by creating multiple date tables. Sometimes that's just not feasible. Multiple customer tables, multiple geography tables, multiple so on and so forth. Another way to handle it is through DAX inside of your data model. So I could build another relationship from the date to the ship date. And so what I have is I have two relationships. I have one that is active that's on order date and I have one that is inactive that's on ship date. By default, the system will only use the order date, the active one, right? So how do I get both? How do I see my total sales, my total cost, my total transactions, my year to date based on the order date and I can see all of those same measures based on my shipping date. Well, normally if I have 50 measures in my model, I got to rebuild all 50 measures overriding the current filter context like so, but I'm going to show you a cool trick. So hold in there. If I go back over to my report view, I can come in here and say, all right, let's build. Let me show you. I can say, I'm going to build a new measure 
and this measure is going to override the current filter context and use the inactive relationship. So I'll do something like, you know, total sales for shipping date, and that's going to equal, and then I'm just going to type this out. Now, I'm not going to teach you DAX here. Go take a look at my three-hour session that somebody just dropped in the chat window, and I'm going to do total sales, and then I'm going to tell it I want to use that existing relationship so I'm using a different relationship than the default and I'm gonna take it from let's see fact sales and we're gonna use the ship date here and we're gonna relate that back to our date table like so use relationship does not create a relationship it will use a relationship that you've already defined so you must define that relationship in your model first all right I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter and then I'm going to get this cleaned up so everybody can see the results side by side real quick. There you go. This is total sales based on the active current relationship in the model. And the other one is total sales where we have modified the filter context using the use relationship function and calculate. Now, if I wanted to see total cost, total transactions, year to date, year over year, all of my other measures for the ship date, what would I have to do? If I had 50 measures, I'd have to go rebuild all 50 measures to do this. And if you had multiple dates, ship date, order date, due date, invoice date, paid date, you'd have to build five versions of every measure to satisfy all those requirements. That is not feasible or maintainable. However, thanks to external tools, thanks to things like tabular editor, we can use something known as calculation groups. And so calculation groups is what I'm going to talk about real quick. It's one measure that can, it's like the, 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 you know, one ring to rule them all, one measure to rule them all. So let me show you something real quick, all right? I'm gonna go ahead and just delete that measure. We don't need it. We're gonna delete it from the model and then I'll delete it from my table. And let me show you something really cool. So under external tools, there is, in my video, I talk about how to kind of set this up. And uh, I'll go over to my tabular editor here. And in tabular editor, I haven't actually done this in a while, so hopefully I can remember how to do this. I'm gonna go into my model and create a new calculation group. This is gonna be really cool once you see the results of this. Now, what would I normally call this? So new calculation group, let's call this um, measures, I'm gonna do measures by ship date, okay? So measures by ship date. And then I'm gonna go into my calculation group and we're gonna create a new calculation item. And this is actually gonna be current measure normally you'll do two different ones in here you'll do like current measure and you'll do like measure by ship date so you can see them side by side so let's do that i'm going to do current measure and current measure is going to use a function in dax called oh it didn't name it that's weird there we go it's going to use a function in mat dax called selected measure all right so that's dynamic. It's going to automatically pick that up. Then I'm going to create another calculation item here. And this one is going to be called um, measure, let's just call it ship date or buy ship date or something like that. Now I haven't done this in a while, so hopefully I'm not messing this up. And I'm going to come up here and I'm going to say, all right, let's do calculate. And then what measure are we going to put in? We want this to work for every measure, sales, cost, transactions, year to date, whatever. So if I want this to work for every measure, I can't type in total sales. I have to type in something else. And what I'm gonna type in here is gonna be selected measure, right? So selected measure, then we're gonna use use relationship again, like we did before. The only thing I'm changing that's different than what you saw in Power BI is selected measure. Under use relationship, I have to tell it what relationship I wanna use, and I'm gonna make sure I don't mess up the typing here because there's no IntelliSense. I'm on an older version, by the way, so there might be IntelliSense in a newer one, just to be aware of. I don't know. I'm gonna go grab my ship date from, oh, I clicked away, whoops. I'm gonna grab my ship date from here and drop it right there, put a comma, and then I'll go down to my date table. So let's jump back over to the dim date table. We're gonna grab the date column from the date table. I clicked away again. I'm gonna keep doing that apparently, and I'll drop it right there. All right, and then I'm gonna close it, that's gonna be one, I need to close it again, that's gonna be two, and hopefully that works. So now I'm gonna go up to the top and click save. All right, looks pretty good, we're gonna hope for the best. So I'm gonna minimize this and go away. My model should prompt me here, I'm kind of 
kind of odd that it's not prompting me. Is my calculation group here? Nope, that definitely did not recognize it. Let me save that again. That would be very unfortunate. I have it in my saved file, file though. I'll open up my saved file if this doesn't work. So normally you create them and then you just save it to your model. Save the changes to the connected database. Services, yeah, interesting. All right, let's jump to the completed and hopefully I saved it there in the final file. So I'm gonna open that up real quick. Yeah, I don't know. Let me check the chat, see if you guys are helping me out here. All right, so I'm opening up the completed and I'm hoping I saved it there because calculation groups are really awesome. And oh, I have it, cool, super exciting. That's why it's good to have a backup. Not sure why it didn't work, but here's my, um, my calculation group that I was trying to show you guys that I was creating a moment ago. So what I wanna do is let me rebuild the visual real fast, right? So I'm gonna build a matrix here. And in my matrix, I'm gonna bring in the year like we did before, keep it very simple. And by the way, if you're following along, you can open up the completed file just like I just did. And I'm gonna go over to my fact cells and I'm gonna bring in my total cells, all right? So now I have my total cells. Remember, this is total cells by order date. This is based on the order date because that's the active relationship in my data, mo data model. Now, if I go down here to the bottom where I have my column name, I'm gonna drag that and drop it into the columns on this matrix and watch what happens with that value, 10595. This kept the current measure. That's what I was trying to do. So you can see the current, but now I also see the shift date, but here's the cool part. This works for all my measures. So if I bring in total cost, I now have the total cost by the current relationship and by the shift date. If I bring in my total transactions, right? Expand this a little bit more. Now I have my total transactions by the order date and by the shift date. So I've created one measure that dynamically is going to work across all of my measures instead of having to create countless versions of that. Now I went through this quickly, which I always do to get you more information from the presentation and talk through concepts, but I have a YouTube video on the YouTube channel, Pragmatic Works, that actually is called Calculation Groups Role Playing Tables, and I'll walk through this exact demo there. So if you wanna go back and watch it again, you can either rewatch this entire thing or you can go watch that video, which is very, very helpful. This is also helpful for other types of calculations though, not just this role playing idea. So if you say, Mitchell, I need to build total sales year to date, total cost year to date, total transactions year to date, profit margin, you know what, profit margin is not, not a good one, but if you had 20 columns and you had to build a year to date for all of those, you could go over to calculation groups in the tabular editor and you could say total YTD, selected measure, date, date, close it out. And that works across all of those. Calculation groups are really, really cool. Definitely part of your data model to make this work and save you a lot of time and effort. So thank you to Microsoft and the Power BI community for giving us those kind of tools. All right, so that was that part right there. The next thing I wanna talk about is, I wanna talk about aggregated tables, aggregation tables. I really wanna talk about two things, okay? So we're gonna pivot a little bit. Let me make sure I didn't miss any questions. And I'm gonna close out the completed one. Completed one is good. I'm gonna close it out and go back to our model real fast. And then no idea what happened with tabular editor. So if somebody knows, let me know. Let's see if we have any questions that I can answer real quick for the group since we're transitioning. Bald book tuber said, best invention ever calculation groups. I don't know about that, but they're definitely awesome. Uh, tabular editor rock says Peter. So really just a lot of great comments and stuff here. So thank you everybody for that. Um, how can I parameterize start and finish dates of the model? Um, so there is a way to, if you wanna add filters to your model, that's a good question. Let's take a look at that real fast. If you wanna parameterize your model so that I'm only importing data for like the last two years or three years, but you wanna be able to change that in the future, you absolutely can do that through something called parameters. And so I'll show a very, very brief example of that. And then uh, we'll switch up to the next section that I wanted to talk about, all right? So if I go into transform data here, and I go to my fact cells, you know that we can add filters, right? And so I could come in here and add a filter that says, hey, only bring back the data 
that is after 2015 or after 2016. So I can add some filters in here, but we wanna make it more dynamic so that we can parameterize it and change it from like the Power BI service. So we publish it to the service and then inside of the Power BI service, when I'm doing a scheduled refresh, I wanna be able to change the parameter there, right? You can do that and that's really a great way to do this. You shouldn't have to go back and open all your Power BI reports to update those parameters. So what I can do is I can say up here at the top that I want to manage parameters. You have to, I think you have to turn this on in your model and I'm going to tell it that I want to go ahead and manage parameters and you would normally come in here and create a couple of manage uh, parameters. So click one, click two. I might create one called start date. You might even just call it only start date and then you just do everything up until that start. Oh, I deleted the wrong one. There we go. Data type, I would do a date and then um, just a selected value. So you put a value in here that would be one, one, and let's go with 2013, right? So now I have a parameter that you can modify from outside of the Power Query Editor or outside of Power BI Desktop in general. You can modify it a couple different ways. The primary method is usually from the Power BI service when you refresh this. So this is a question. This is not planned. This is based on your questions in the chat window. So now I can click OK and I can go back over to, I have this parameter that I can change. I can go back to my fact table and say, look, I only wanna bring in the data that's after whatever date I specified. So I can go in here and say date filter. I can say after, right? So we're just adding a basic filter. And then I can say is after parameter, and there's my start date. And when I click okay, assuming I set it up correctly, we're only gonna get data that is after 2013. There's a lot more you can do with this. You can make it dynamic, you can use expressions but we're just kind of using a parameter. And when I publish this to the Power BI service, the service is going to recognize that parameter and you can modify it there. You can change it in the future. So that is hopefully going to answer that question. Now, back on track, what I wanted to cover next, we did the parameters and then I said I wanted to cover what? What did I say I was going to cover next before I got distracted there? Oh, aggregate. So let me talk about a very important concept when it comes to data modeling. So one thing that we had to do a lot of time with customers that we worked with is, you know, when you build a table, I had a customer one time that had one table and they had uh, like 20 of these tables, one table, they were a telecommunications company, had 400 million rows of data per day, 400 million rows for that table. SMS text messages had 200 million, all right? So that's a lot of data. And we did it in SQL Server. We didn't do it in dedicated pools or Snowflake or some MPP, massive parallel processing architecture. We did it inside of SQL Server on-prem. And so when you go to run your reports against a database that has literally hundreds of billions of rows, you don't necessarily get the best performance. So something that we would do for customers like that is we would create different types of fact tables to try to satisfy their requirements. So we would create like aggregated fact tables that roll it up to a higher level. So you still have the granular level of detail, but we also would load snapshot fact tables or aggregated fact tables, right? So that's what I wanna talk about with Power BI real quick. So I can do the same thing in Power BI. I can create my fact sales table. I can say, hey, this table, let me remove that filter by the way so we can get all our data. I'm gonna clear that filter. I can take this table and I can say, you know what, I want to I want to duplicate the table again because we're going to build an aggregate table real quick. Now, when you bring data into Power BI, you can import data, you can do direct query, or you can do live connection to analysis services. But those are really your three primary options. If you have hundreds of millions of rows of data, for most people, you're not going to be able to import that data to Power BI, right? And generally speaking, direct query does not perform super great, right? Like if you import the data, it performs awesome. When you're doing direct query and your DAX has to get converted to like, you know, T-SQL and it has to run against an engine and bring that data back, generally it doesn't perform that well. What if I could leave my data in the original database for the very detailed data, but I could also have an imported version of the table that was aggregated up that answered most of my questions automatically. So if I know that my customers are you know, oftentimes looking at sales by month by customer, I could create a fact table that is sales by customer by month that maybe goes from 200 million rows to only 50,000 rows. I can import 50,000 rows. And so any query 
that runs against the aggregate table is going to return lightning fast, right? So aggregate tables from a data modeling perspective are very, very important. And that's the conversation that we're now rolling into is kind of how do we work with that? How do we set that up? Power BI has some really cool capability. Now, I'm not going to be able to do it here. And I agree with Peter, uh, column store indexes were useful because I was using 2014 and we used column store indexes for that database. Um, but what I want to do here for this table is I want to create a duplicate. And so I'm going to go ahead and duplicate this table real quick. And we're going to call this one our fact aggregate cells. So I'll rename it real quick here. We'll call that fact aggregate cells. And then we're going to go ahead and aggregate this up. So again, a lot of times I would do this type of cleaning. I would do this in SQL Server. I would do it in my query before I bring it in. But for those of you who are like, hey, I'm an analyst. I come from Excel. How do I do it here? You can do it the way I'm about to show you right now. So I'm going to go up to the transform tab here at the very top and I'm going to tell it I want to do a group by and when I click group by and I pull this up I'm going to tell it that I want to group by whatever columns are important to us now you can create multiple versions of an aggregate table you can do this however you want so let's say that we want to roll this up to product ID we do want to see it by product ID we also want to see it by another grouping and I say let's do it at the day level so I want to see this by I want to see my sales my cost my total transactions, I want to see it by product, by order date. All right, so let's look at what this looks like. So now I'm going to go down to my new column name. We're going to create one called total sales. By the way, as we're going through this, if you guys like the training that we do here at Pragmatic Work, make sure to take a look at our on-demand training. Make sure to take a look at our live training boot camps. That's what keeps me employed and I love doing what I do. So, you know, tell your family and friends, put it on LinkedIn. Um, we would appreciate that. So I'm going to go ahead and do total sales and I'm going to do sum of unit price. All right. I'm going to create another one in here. This is going to be called total cost. And that's also going to be a sum, right? That's going to be the sum and we'll say sum of unit cost. And then let's add in account rows like a total transaction like we've done before, right? So we can do a total by day and that's going to do account rows on the table. Now this is creating an aggregate table. Remember the original table had 700,000 rows. We're going to see how many this one has when we load it, but it's going to be significantly less. So that original table, we didn't import the data because we could not, right? It was too much. But the aggregate table, we can, and that can significantly improve performance, especially on queries that are only doing a filter by the product ID and the order date. So if we're not going down to the customer level, because we do lose dimensionality, if we have to do a filter on customer, this table won't work. If we have to do a filter on what else was in there? Geography. This table won't work, right? So now if I go back and click OK, Sarah is looking forward to the DAX bootcamp in October. I am too, Sarah. I'll see you there. So I'm going to go ahead and run this real quick. Now this aggregated up my data and here's what you see. This first row of data, product ID of 449 on July 26, had 86 rows originally in the original um, in the original fact table. But now we've taken those 83 rows and we've consolidated them down to one row. So you see how you start to reduce the size of your data model. And if you can use these aggregate tables in a very effective manner, again, you can greatly improve performance. So let's, let's take a look at this. So I don't have a bad performing model. We're not going to be able to see any great performance tuning tips here, but you get the idea of modeling for success, right? So now if I hit close and apply over here, um, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do the coolest feature here because we're not using direct query, but you'll see in a moment. So I'm going to hit close and apply. All right. That's going to load the table in. We're going to go look at that table. Let me see how many rows of data that is. It might tell us right here. Let's see if we have any other questions. Just wondering, is it okay to sum up unit price? It is, but it depends on the data, right? So like I know that in this data, every row represents only a quantity of one, so it's okay. But if I had quantities that were more than one, like five or seven, then it doesn't make sense to do that. First, you'd have to multiply the quantity times the unit price to get a new column, then you would sum up that column. So in this data model, we only have uh, one item on each row, so it's okay, but it depends. Can you show how to use group by in a model that I created from joining multiple tables? Uh, 
I don't have that model, but if you send me an email, I could try to help you out with that. So send me an email, admin coe22. Can that parameter update from a web service? Yes, yes. When you publish it out to the Power BI service, you can update it from there. If you happen to be running some kind of update, publishing your Power BI report in a different way, you can pass those parameters in. All right, so let's take a look at our fact aggregate sell table real quick. We've covered a ton of material here today. I'm glad you guys were able to join us. And if I go over to my fact sales table, we had 675,000 rows, so right at about 700,000 rows. If I go back over to my fact aggregate sales table, we went from almost 700,000 down to 82,000. So it's a tenth of its original size, right? So this is a huge reduction in the size of my table, and it might give me that flexibility to be able to now import that in if my original table was a direct query, right? So for those of you working with bigger data models, you're like, how do I make this perform better? Aggregate tables are great. Now, the way my model is designed right now would require me as an end user to know to use one table versus the other, right? If I'm like, hey, I'm in here and I'm trying to build a report right here. Let's say that I was trying to build a report and my report, let me make sure I've built my model. Do I have a relationship in here? I have a relationship on product. That's great. And I need a relationship on order date as well. Let me add that in. All right. So I'm going to come over here and let's update this visualization real quick to be product name. We'll get rid of year. And so we're going to have product name by total sales. Now, let's say that, you know, you can come up here to performance analyzer, turn it on, look at performance. This performance is fine. But let's say performance wasn't that good. Then what I could do is say, all right, I don't want to sum up the sales that's coming from that table that has hundreds of millions of rows, direct query. What I want to do instead is I'm going to remove total sales from this table, go over to my fact aggregate sales, and I'm going to bring in total sales from that table. All right. And so now I have the total sales and it's going to be a lot faster because it's not having to do a sum operation across hundreds of millions of rows, but only across maybe those 50,000 rows that are imported in my model in memory, ready to go. Right. So that can have tremendous improvement in performance by doing that. Now, the problem with this, let's think about this, is that now you have to go to each of your end users and they have to decide themselves when they build a visual, which one to use. And maybe today, I build this report and it is only filtered by product. But then somebody comes in later and they say, well, I'm going to go grab what like geography. And so I add a slicer in here on country, right? So let's turn that into a slicer and I click USA. And unfortunately it's one country. So let's do, let's do something other than country. Let's do state. I click Alaska and it doesn't change. I click Alabama and it doesn't change. And it doesn't change because that fact table has absolutely positively no relationship to my geography. That's a problem because now that causes a lot more work for your end users and you training them. However, however, Power BI has a really cool feature that's available that we can take advantage of. And that feature is called aggregations that are managed by Power BI, right? If you want the presentation slides, guys, email me directly. I'll get them to you. I'll send you the PDF. Apologies for not having that in the class files. I'll drop my email in there for everybody again. All right, I will hook you up. Just let me know. Sorry about that. All right, so what Power BI could do, what if, what if your end user didn't even know that this fact aggregate sales table did not exist, right? They didn't even know it exists. They have no idea. They build their reports like they always do. They go to the original sales table, they bring in the cells from that sales table, right? And then sometimes it performs really awesome and sometimes it doesn't because the engine in the background can figure out and can determine if it should use the aggregate table or if it should use the other table. Power BI can do that. It is phenomenal. This is a really awesome feature. So the way you set that up, and it's not going to work for me because we're not actually doing direct query or anything like that is you come over to the left, you go to your report view, and you find the table that you want to be managed by Power BI automatically. So Power BI will automatically decide, should I use that table or should I not, right? And what you do is you'll right click on that aggregate table. There are some requirements to this that are a little bit frustrating. You gotta make sure that 
whatever columns are in your aggregate table match exactly the data types that are in the original tables. So if that doesn't match, it won't map up correctly and you'll get kind of some issues with that. Also, I've never really done aggregates when you've imported both tables because it kind of doesn't make sense. I could see where you get a very small possible performance improvement there, but generally when you're going to be doing this is when your original sources are going to be direct query and you can see tremendous performance gains by doing this. So all of my data is imported into Power BI. So this isn't going to actually let me do this, but I'm going to show you the process anyway, right? So if I come over here and click manage aggregations, I'm going to get a screen that looks like this, right? And so what I'll do is say, all right, fact aggregate scales tells that's the right one. Um, for order date and product ID, I already did the group by in the original query and I've already defined the relationship in my model. So since the relationship is defined, I don't have to do anything with those. Just keep that in mind. Then you have to go down to total cost, total sales and transactions and really duplicate the work that you did before. So I'd come in and I would tell it that I want to do a sum and I'd click here and I'd go down to my fact sales. And in my fact sales, I would tell it I want to sum up my fact sales unit cost. Then I would do the same thing for total sales. I'd say sum and I would go down to my fact sales and I'd say fact sales unit price and I would sum those up. So with this, the reason it's grayed out, I think the reason it's grayed out is you see right here it says fact sales. Oh, I actually could not find this in the documentation and I just saw it pop up there. Son of a gun, I can't freeze it. Fact sales must be a direct query table to be used in the detail for an aggregate. In other words, it doesn't support the way I'm currently using it. But if you had left your data in the original database and did a direct query to that, not importing it in, this right here would actually allow you to do this. So I'm showing you the steps, although we, I didn't have time to load all this into like an Azure SQL database before class today. So I can't follow through the full demo, but this is really awesome. And so you do that. Then you come down to total transactions and you tell it, hey, I want to count the table rows. You choose your table. Again, not going to work because it's not direct query. And then when you're done, you click apply all. That will automatically hide the table and then it will automatically hide the columns. Your end user doesn't know it exists, but it will use it automatically. So that's really one of the coolest uh, features there. Oh, window shift S to freeze. I am not going to test that out in the middle of a live presentation because I might be getting trolled, but I will test that out later. I'm writing it down right now. That would be hilarious if I hit that and it just shut everything down. Um, let's look at some questions real quick. I'm going to zoom out. I know I saw a lot of stuff coming in. Sorry, I joined late. What are the main difference between Snowflake schema and star schema? Star schema is ideal because we want to keep our model as simple as possible. As the model grows and it grows in complexity and we have more tables, there will be times where we need to add in some snowflakes like we did here, where we actually did have a snowflake in here a little bit with this category segment, but we built that in so we could drill across our fact budget and our fact sales. So now the benefit of that, we didn't really show it, right? But if I come in here and build a visual that pulls information from both of those tables. So I go over to my dim cat, set, um, cat segment. Let's pull in category. I can now drill across both fact tables. This is the big benefit of multiple fact tables here. So I can go over to, let's go down to fact sales and bring in our total sales. And then let's go down to our budget table and bring in our value there. All right. And so I'd have to mess with this because it looks like it's not summing that. Let's see if we can sum that value up. What is that data type? It says it's default is sum. Mm, let me do a real quick. Actually, it's not. Yeah, it's duplicating there. Let me do a real quick sum on that. That's interesting. So we're going to create a measure on that real quick to make sure we're doing that. And then let me go verify the relationship again. So we're going from Demcat segment. So that should be good. I want to show you guys the, the drill across functionality. I'm going to verify data types real fast here because they should map. So that is an integer value. And then in my fact budget, that is also an integer value. 
They are one through 10, that is perfect. So we're gonna wind up summing up the value and then we'll go with either forecast or budget here. So let's go back. And then I'm gonna create a measure real quick so we can kind of look at that and then I'll come back to questions. Fact budget, let's create a measure. And we'll call this one total budget equals, we're gonna do the sum. And then the name of the table is fact budget value. English United States. We're going to get rid of value from this table. Let's bring that in. There we go. And so now what I see is I'm able to drill across, no idea what was happening with that column, no time to debug it right now. But I'm able to drill across category and see what my total sales were and what my budget was for that. Now this is across all years. So if we wanna look at years, because year relates to both tables too, we can bring that in as a slicer. So this is how you handle multiple fact tables in your model. It's actually really easy. And this goes back to that question people were asking earlier. Why would I build a star schema and not just leave it in a flat table? If you left it in a flat table, drilling across multiple fact tables like this would be very, very difficult. It doesn't give you that flexibility, versatility, adaptability for the future like we talked about before, aside from all the other benefits. But because we've built the model the way we did, and I had not tested this before the class today, I just knew it would kind of work in this way. Um, we're able to now add additional facts in the future to continue to build this out. So if I come in here and I add in the year right here and we add that as a slicer, where's my slicer at? It's hiding from me. We'll just click on it here. You can see that it's filtering it accordingly based on the year as well. So we're able to see my total sales and my budget for 2016, my total sales and my budget for 2015. This is really, really awesome capability, multiple fact tables, dimensions that conform across our different business areas in our model. This is really, really awesome. All right, so we are actually near the end of our day here. I'm going to start looking through and answering questions here for really about the next five or so minutes. And then we will uh, we'll wrap things up. Again, Devin actually mentioned to me it would be a great idea to do some kind of follow-up after this where we actually do some kind of Q&A, where we get together and take questions from the group like what y'all have here. And I think that would be awesome. So keep your ears open for that. Maybe we'll do like a one hour or 30 minute event where you can send in questions and we uh, go through that. I think that would be super cool. All right, let's see. How do, how, do, how to do a run rate calculation basis month number? If it is April selected, it should do number times 12 divided by four. Uh, you'll have to email that to me. I don't quite understand that calculation. You can publish your data model to Power BI online and have others use it as a Power BI data set. Yes, great point. So facts with DAX, I love that point, right? This is actually something I should have had on my list. So I built a really awesome data model. I've named it, I've created my calculated measures, I've built in multiple facts, and I don't want everybody on my team to have to go build their own data model that has different variations and different logic. What if I could take it and publish the entire thing to the Power BI workspace, give them access to build from that Power BI model so then they connect doing a live connection and they just build reports. They don't have to worry about building the data model. You can do that and that is actually a, a best practice. So that is a, a great job. Thank you for bringing that up. Will this session be made available? Yes, it will be recorded on our YouTube channel for your uh, viewing pleasure. So please feel free to go back and look at that. Is it possible to extract monthly budget from the yearly budget figures easily? I guess with a DAX measure, absolutely. I actually do that in our advanced DAX class and I do it in our advanced Power BI class. Essentially what you have to do is when it's on the date, if you have the date there, like if you were looking at the month, you'd have to count the number of days in the month, divide the yearly total by that and you would have to do that in the DAX, which could be kind of complex depending on what you're trying to do. But yes, you could do that with DAX. Can you talk through the importance or lack of importance of marking a date table as a date table, please? So in our situation, we're okay with not marketing it as a date table. Um, but if you had turned on in your model the automatic time intelligence, which I actually recommend against, let me talk about that. So I recommend in your model under options and settings, I recommend turning off the auto date time intelligence. There's a lot of reasons for why you should turn it off. I do not turn it off. I don't keep it on. And you can turn it off in two places. One, under data load, I believe it is right here. You can turn it off and that's for global, all Power BI reports in the future. And under current file, I would turn it off for the current file. So once you turn that off, 
then it doesn't automatically create date hierarchies in the background for every date column that you have, right? So first of all, I would turn that off. If you did not turn it off and you mark your date table right here as a date table by right clicking, make sure my head's out of the way, and you mark that as a date table, that will automatically turn it off for that date table, anything that's in there. So that's number one. If you were doing the relationship from your date table to your fact table, to your fact budget, to your fact inventory, whatever, on a date key, that's an integer kind of smart key. So like today is August 11th of 2022. What you would do is you'd create a key that would be like 2022-0811. It's an integer, it's a smart key. If you were building a relationship on a key instead of the date, time intelligence, those built-in time intelligence functions actually won't work. So you have to mark your date table as a date table for that to work. We're actually okay with what we're doing here because I'm using just the original date. But as a best practice, we should be using those smart date keys because it is gonna be optimal for joins and performance and things like that. How do you compare, compute year over year, month to date, and other comparison measures? Those are actually really easy to do. If you go take a look at my three hour DAX presentation that I did, I'm pretty sure I cover all of those in there. Um, but also our on-demand learning and our DAX boot camps. I think the one in August is sold out. So I posted it, but it's sold out, the one for August 29th. But we do them about every month. But if you go there, we talk through all of those different time intelligence things in our boot camps. Good question. Oh, if I wanted Power BI visualization in PowerPoint slide, Microsoft actually just released that. That is awesome. It has nothing to do with this presentation. But Microsoft just released that. I forget, I was testing it out the other day. It is awesome. So once you publish, I think you gotta publish it to the Power BI service first, then you can go up to file in the service and you can say PowerPoint and it actually will load it into PowerPoint, the live interactive Power BI report, which is incredible. We've been waiting for that for a very long time. That's a great question. Could you give us a glimpse of the scenario you mentioned earlier with breaking out budget tracking from the monthly amount? So no, Mohammed, because that's just a longer calculation. Ultimately, what we would do with that, um, and I kind of mentioned it a minute ago, is inside of a table, let's say I had a table right here, I'll kind of give you the scenario, and this will probably be the last question and then um, we'll wrap things up for the day. But if I had a table here with the dates in it, and then I had in that table with the dates, let's say my fact sales, where's that at? And I bring that over and drop that right there. If I wanted to be able to look at like my year to date, let's do year to date, that's even better, year to date sales. Maybe I wanna be able to compare my year to date sales to my year to date budget, right? But my budget isn't at that level. This is a different level of granularity. So then we'd have to write DAX that figures out, hey, you're at 23 days into the year, there's 365 days in the year, divide 23 by 365 to get a percent, multiply that percent times the budget that's at the year level. It's at the month level, you would do that calculation. So that's the gist of it, right? At a high level, that's kind of how you would calculate it out. Of course, we're working with varying filter context. So we have to consider all the filters that are applied there. And then somebody said, Mitchell is my favorite. Thank you for that. Your $20 is on the way. You pulled through. I'm just kidding, no 20 bucks for you, but I do appreciate that I'm your favorite. Um, yeah, you might need, Facts with Dax said you might need a um, uh, an add-on, yeah. All right, hey everybody, we're ending a little bit early today, which is okay, we covered a ton of material. It was great, phenomenal interaction from everybody. A lot of people still on the call two and a half later, hours later, which is crazy. I'm glad you guys learned a lot. Thank you for all of the great feedback. Peter, make sure to send me an email. I'm gonna send you that PDF. Uh, it's gonna have your name all over it. And then for everybody else, again, we just wanna tell you thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time. Thank you, everybody.